You are listening to Space Boy Universe on the SBU Network. Explore the universe with Space Boy and Sir Lana. Greetings and welcome to Space Boy Universe. I'm Space Boy and across from me is a lovely Serana and tonight is another wonderful night. We have guests uh, coming in tonight from the group Pony Trap. Quentin and Hillary will be joining us a little bit at the bottom of the hour. Uh, hey, it is 6.30.18. Man, has the year gone by? We're already at the six-month mark, and it is crazy. Man, time flies when you're having fun, right? Uh, as always, you can follow us on Twitter. That's at the SB Universe. But follow Space Boy and Serlana. That's at Serlana and at Space Boy Music. And, of course, follow the, uh, the network that brings you all this fine program at the SBU Network. Um, of course, uh, with your tweets tonight, you want to do hashtag Space Cadets or hashtag Space Cadet and then, of course, hashtag SBU um, Network. Um, you know, you can follow us uh, just about everywhere. I mean, I've said this so many times over the, year, uh, uh, the years uh, in front of the, uh, you know, the main program, and that is you can follow us on Twitter, you can follow us on Facebook, you can follow us just about anywhere social media is, and that's just by looking for Space Boy Universe. You know, and speaking of Space Boy Universe being on uh, multimedia and all that good stuff, um, YouTube is a great place to go for finding us because uh, generally that's where we uh, have more than just a space boy archive of shows and that is like for example two big gamers uh i guess at the conventions when we do video live interviews um space boy music gets put up there when we ever do a music show um you know just so go to youtube search for space boy universe and um that'll get you in and when and of course as always subscribe it's your duty as a space kid to do so and of course slap that bell uh, at the top, and that way you'll get notified every time uh, an angel gets its wings. So, and so further on, um, you know, you can also catch SBU on the go, and that's pretty easy too. Uh, you know, we're on iTunes, we're on YouTube, uh, we are on iHeartMedia. Uh, just take your pick and roll with it because, you know, there's nothing better to do when you're going to work out or whatever, driving in your car, stuck in traffic. Uh, listen to us on the way home, you know, while you're yelling at people. Uh, that's usually the best way to go. So just yeah. check out any different programming. So. <laughs> feed your angst. Yeah, feed your angst by a little SB, SBU on the go. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing something. Oh, yeah. Um, so um, we've added a new, a new button to our website, and I'm encouraging people to go check it out. It's, it's a donation button. If you can fill it uh, in your heart to donate some money to the, the, to the cause, that'd be great. Uh, we're not forcing anybody. You know, we don't really run here on commercials although we uh, you know show a lot of people you know we've got advertisement on our website and everything generally we don't really charge for that because we just believe in those people and we push uh, their um, their products because we hate asking for stuff like this uh -huh. but it's not inexpensive to run this show in mm -hmm. fact we could take the money it takes to do this and get out of debt faster but 
we choose to do this because it helps with our sanity. Yes, it does. By the way, that's the lovely Serlana. Welcome her to the broadcast because she likes to broadcast too, as long as there's no people well, in I front of us. Well, I can fake it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So, but yeah, um, we're doing the donation drive thing kind of, you know, and there's a button there. So, you know, whether it's a dollar or even more than that, um, to be straightforward with you, our, generally our cost per month are about $500 per month to run the, the show with all the technology and all the good stuff that makes this happen. And if, you know, even if it's just a dollar, you can donate. That's great. We're not twisting your arm and, and we're not going to say it's your obligation as a space cadet to do so. But uh, if you fill it within your heart and you enjoy the program, um, you know, feel free to donate. That would be awesome. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely recognize you. So, you know, with that said, Sir Lana, um, I want to move on to uh, my, day, my day job. Now, many of the people that have listened to this program know that I do tech tech support, and I uh, I'm a technician. You. Well, no, I, I'm commenting on something that happened Friday. Um, you know, you know, I'm a big fan of a certain internet provider. That, oh yes. Okay, so okay. yesterday, yesterday, I'll just sit here. Uh, yeah. So yesterday, you know, I'm minding my own business. It's quiet for a Friday, and all of a sudden, we start getting calls out the wazoo. And apparently, uh, Comcast had a major nationwide outage yesterday. Did you ever find out why? No, I don't think we will. But I can tell you uh, one thing is that uh, uh, this is why Comcast doesn't need to be uh, buying Fox. Mm -hmm. I mean, because uh, they need to focus on themselves. How many billions were they going to give to Fox? I'm just saying, you know, mm. you know they could have spent uh, all those billions on, you know, protecting their infrastructure and, and making it better for their business, uh, maybe even bringing their uh, support system uh, back to the United States and having instead of having to call an outside line to another country for help support. Um, I mean, it's pretty terrible as a consumer. Now, um, <laughs> I'm not going to go further than that. I'm just going to say as a consumer, it is tough to be a Comcast uh, consumer. Um but as a business, uh, I've seen that... Uh, that we, there are no options. There really are no options. We're on business could, class. Yeah, we're on business class. And just, there's just no other options. And so as a consumer, though, it's tough. Um, but, um, but anyway, getting back to what I was saying is that um, thank you, Comcast, for making me work my rear end off on Thursday and, and, and upsetting a lot of customers out there. And uh, still no explanation on why you're... you're uh, your backbone, the backbone is what went down um, and really messed a lot of people up. So, uh, so that's my, um, I guess my first goat of the evening. <laughs> so, you know, there you go. I mean, a three goat night, I bet. Oh, three goats, three goats. You say it three times fast. Uh, what is it like Beetlejuice or something like that? The goat appears. <clears throat> Can I take a moment? Oh, okay. Just quick. To testify. Quick. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Let me just, although he will never hear it here. And I've already called him. Today is my father's 83rd birthday. And it would have also been my mother's 83rd birthday had she uh, survived cancer. But they were born same year, same day, same month. How crazy is that? And uh, it gets a little crazier. Space Boy was born on the 18th of a month. And I was born on the 18th of a month. So just... Weird and, number things in our lives, you know. And we met on a 30th, got engaged on a 30th. No, you planned married. that. You, How did you I deliberately planned plan? No, we just met, we met on October 30th, I, and then well, you the, decided the, the first from there initial. on, if if anything was going to be significant and we were going to stay together, it was going to happen on October 30th from then on the rest of our lives. Hmm. Well, anyway, so, um, hey, let me throw some shout-outs to some of our space cadets that are listening tonight. Uh, we got Catalina in the shop. Hey, girl. Uh, we've got Bob and Beverly, which is always a treat. Uh, I'm glad to see you. Um, um, we've got Yeg, uh, code for some other name. And uh, we love you, our great uh, neighbor from the great white north. Um, hey, Tanner is in the house, and we appreciate you showing up, Tanner. Some awesome space cadets joining us tonight. Some, and, and Some new ones I, I don't uh, quite recognize. But. Yeah, um, and as the night goes on, we might shout your name as we go, but those are some hardcore space cadets. You're probably going to have to join the space cadet crew here, or the space force, if you will. Um, hey, you there's a, the, if I don't say his name, he, he is going to like feel de depressed and everything, but hey, it's K-28. He had his son patented. 
Uh, what? I'm going to have to find that out later. What, that's, <laughs> what is that all about? Yeah, so... Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's good to see all the crew there and Hey, hello, Martin. Nice to see you in the chat room. Um, it's always a pleasure to see new people that we haven't seen before or in a while. Uh, so, you know, I just love the fact that, um, you know, we got all our usual suspects in there and, uh, uh hopefully it'll be a great show for you tonight. You, well, you know, it's going to be a great show. Cause you got you a compliment on your music. You, you tuned in. Um, well, it looks like Catalina says, uh, Space Boy, I listened to your music driving through the backcountry roads today and uh, was fun, uh, change, a fun change from uh, country to techno. Well, I kind of do that same two-step myself, Catalina. I go from my stuff to a little bit of country. I'm talking about old-style country like uh, Patsy Klein and uh, 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 some of the other classics out there. He keeps so. that to himself, thank yeah. God. Well, you know, she's not much of a country <laughs> Western person. No, Patsy person. Klein, I went through Patsy Klein phase in the 90s because the 90s was terrible for music. Uh, I appreciate her, K20, but I can't. K twenty eight son works for the U.S. Patent Office. It's not his pat. I think he got it patented. <laughs> That's what I mean. So, um, well, before the the show tonight, well, a little bit before the show tonight, you finally got to watch Justice League. Well, it's not like anything was holding me back. I finally broke down. And went, you know what? I'm curious. You already had it bought. So mm -hmm. I watched it. Well, you know, I, I and I asked you eight million questions while yeah, we were watching it. Yeah, I. I but you'd already I, seen I, it. I, I just don't understand why people like to question things during a movie. You know, just watch the show and you'll get your answers. It's just Justice League. It's not like it mattered or anything. Anyway, so uh, overall, what did you think of the movie? Well, I mean, because I know you've I, been overall, kind of I'm like, kind of been like uh, spoiled with Marvel. I universe. know that came out before Marvels infinity hoo-ha and but C civil war it's like okay this is the exact same plot but it's just but you said hey that's the way comic books are they're they're, they're so, both and those are you know dc and and marvel competing against each other sure they're going to have some similar storylines even similar i mean characters. i could get into this if you really want to know yeah uh, i mean it's a, it's a good thing i, I finally got do you to see not this. like ben affleck <laughs> i don't like him as an actor I don't like him as a person. I don't like him as a guy who has a face. So um, that's pretty much it. I think he's, I don't have an opinion on a Batman who's bad. I don't have a dog in that fight, but if you want me to twist my arm and give an opinion, I don't like him as Batman. Well, and when he wears the Batman get up in the mask, it makes his face look fat. So uh, just to point out real quick, you know, a lot of people were not pleased with the fact that they picked Ben Affleck for Batman because right. he originally played Daredevil in a movie and um, yeah he screwed that up too and people were not happy with he's that he's not an action hero yeah. he's not an action guy he's he's just some douche that's supposed to be sitting behind a bar <laughs> maybe if they make <laughs> Cheers the movie he could play Sam <laughs> in his younger years or something sorry that choked me up there um, yeah that's, that's something else but okay I just don't so, like him so I've of heard course, rumors that they're probably gonna not bring him back but that's a smart move but the rest of it the guy who played flash and i know you kept emphasizing this movie came out before spider-man homecoming but his character being so young i guess he's supposed to play about 16 17 his character was like that wide-eyed bushy-tailed child and it was so much mm -hmm. like tom holland's take on spider-man that it felt like one stole from the other i don't know which franchise stole from the other but I didn't hate him. Um, of course, Wonder Woman is freaking awesome. Did, I don't think we needed anybody else to be in that movie but well, her. I, what's, what's interesting is that I love her theme music. She's the best thing. And she just kicks butt. And, of course, Jason Momoa as Aquaman mm -hmm. is just nice to look at. I didn't like the contact lenses they had him wearing. It was a little creepy. But um, he, he spent a decent-ish amount of time shirtless, so I felt somewhat like you got your money's worth but um i like that they made him very manly and powerful and strong and he wasn't this just little weird whale talker you know so he actually mm -hmm. had things he could do outside of water too so mm -hmm. i mean it must be nice to breathe in and out of water so um i could have done without the cyborg guy i really didn't understand his role the like, eh, import cyborg, and I'm not happy about it. I'm like, I know your dad, <laughs> your dad robocopped you, and now we gotta pay, all gotta pay for it. So, 
Uh, I could have done without his character. His character was kind of lame. Really, all you needed was maybe Aquaman, definitely Wonder Woman. And I got a problem with a guy that plays Superman. I don't have a problem with him playing Superman. I have a problem with him as a guy. He's he's very strange as a person. He's just, what? there's something, I'm not even going to get into it here. I talked to you about it earlier, but I'm like, I, I don't. I don't know about him. There's something a little off about him. But he did spend a decentish amount of time shirtless, and it was nice to look at. Well, you know, speaking of nice, Amy Adams was nice. She's uh, nice to look at, too. She's gorgeous eyes. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, uh, so, yeah, I enjoyed that. Uh, and, of course, who doesn't enjoy Wonder Woman, you know? Uh, there's something for men and women for Wonder Woman, and, you know, uh, she's A-OK. And uh, so... I like that. She almost, except for laser eyes and cold breath she's as strong as superman well you, aquaman superman i mean aquaman and wonder Woman are strong like superman but the uh, superman is the strongest out of them mm-hmm. and that's why it took but all the, of them. what uh, the weird thing was like when superman died mm-hmm. quote unquote it's like the whole world went into this morning chaos thing mm-hmm. so Amy Adams is playing the latest version of Lois Lane in the Superman movies, Bev. Mm-hmm. So, and she's got long red hair, and she was that, in that movie Arrival. She did a good job in that. Oh, yeah. She was in, um, in Enchanted or something like that. I never saw yes. that. It was a Disney movie. But um, she's just a good actress. She's nice to look at. She played in that movie we saw that the, the, where they cleaned up the, uh, you know, like uh, when somebody died at a house or something like that, and they she That's, formed a company. It's that, a little obscure, but it yeah. It is, but yeah, I like those indie movies. I mean, who doesn't like a good indie movie? Uh, you watch these big budget movies. Sometimes you just want a little, you know. You so know. Like I said, I I'm done, I didn't have a dog in that fight as far as whether I cared about Justice League or not because it's not something I'm following on a, any regular basis. It was just something to watch because people kept talking about it and talking about it, you know, when it was coming out, after it was out. And then the other two things I I know – which I wasn't interested in, but because I have to sit next to you at some part of the day <laughs> in this marriage, is I have been hearing a lot of Infinity Wars gossip theories and a lot of who oh, Kathleen Kennedy's you, killing Star Wars. So you, you know what's funny about that is that you only seen like the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, because, because you don't I'm see tuning it out. I, I get up in the morning. I'm I'm reading. I'm I'm watching all that stuff. I, during my lunch break, I'll watch some more of that stuff. On my way home, I'll watch it if I'm not calling you. Um, and then when I get home, you only see like, oh, that's something I haven't seen yet. Uh, because I subscribe to several, about four or five different people uh, that are talking about this. And they have their own unique spin on it. And, um, yeah. Because uh, it's important. Well, I mean, look, I'm a st- I, I, you know, I... I, it's hard to say that I'm as big a fan uh, Star Wars as I am with Star Trek. But, I'm um, kind of getting over both of them, uh, but honestly. The, but the thing is that, uh, you know, it comes. To, I've come to realize that uh, um, with Star Wars, I've, I've watched, you know, the, out of the original trilogy, I watched, uh, the, you know, in the theater, so, you know, many times over. Um, I've even, even though people give the prequels a kind of a bad rap, um, because of Jar Jar Brink, uh, Brinks, Binks, Binks, it, it, you know, I still have but watched yeah, those. Yeah, he was so. terrible, but they were so boring, all three of them, except for when Vader became Vader. <sighs> See, uh, I guess at this point, it's all about me. Um, you know, uh, and so we bring ourselves, you know, The Force Awakens. Of course, that's going to be making a lot of money because it's been so long since uh, the last or the um, the uh, what was it? The Return of the Jedi. Yes. And so that made a lot of money. And then, you know, uh, I guess what was it? Uh, Didn't you and I discuss why depressing endings are such... People love movies with big depressing endings like Empire Strikes Back and now the latest Infinity Wars. And you're like... Well, when you've got a, tri- a trilogy, if you will, that middle movie should like be like, holy crap. To hold your interest. What's yeah. going to happen next? I mean, this has gone there and that's gone there and... Uh, so, you know, it, it just makes sense if you do a trilogy that the third one or the second one. It's got to answer some questions. Uh, uh, yeah, it's got to leave you with answers. Tie it all up. Yeah. So um, the thing is that, um, you know, what's been nice about Star Wars, it's not been something that's uh, been, well, prior to The Force Awakens. Well, Force Awakens. It's not been subjected by 
social uh, justice and I'm going to get this wrong again, social justice warriors, that's it, and pushing their own agenda. And, and uh, you know, Star Wars has never been about that. It's been about a good story um, and, and hope for the future where everything's going to pay off. Would you stop laughing while I'm trying to tell this? Sorry, I'm looking at something. What do you, you – I can only imagine you should be paying attention to chat or you're paying attention to what's the conversation going. Okay, sorry. Okay, so anyway, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Solana because I can keep going on this subject matter. Yeah, uh, I think We've, I feel like we we talked to it to death. Well, I don't think it's been talked to death enough. But go ahead, Solana. The floor is yours. Um, since we got a, a musical show tonight, I'd looked into some music topics. Um, YouTube has been trying to get into the music streaming thing too. <clears throat> now, many many months ago, I downloaded their so quote unquote music app and all it was is just just youtube where it sort of filtered more toward music video and i just didn't see any difference between it and the regular youtube app that i had and i'm paying for so they've been retooling it uh lately in the united states mexico australia new zealand and south korea those are the ones that would see the changes uh it also you can also get it for nine ninety nine a month, but I'm thinking if I'm already paying for YouTube Premium, I'll, maybe I don't have to anyway. So they're saying this might be the best contender against Spotify to date because they've redesigned the app. They've got a desktop player now you can download. Um, YouTube says they have advantage because they incorporate not just official versions of songs, but remixes live versions and covers which i'm amazed because they're so stinking strict about copyright content and people you know thinking oh you're trying to make a buck off of someone else's creation um there's a promise that they're going to have artificial intelligence in this that'll make this experience kind of more laid back than some of the other streaming services use it that youtube's going to do all the heavy lifting behind the scenes um it's going to it's going to have a feature called your mixtape uh collection automatically created from music compiled from favorite star star artists songs and you frequently listen to and recommendations which is kind of what spotify has had for a while so i might check it out if i don't have to pay extra for it now, speaking of Spotify, which I do have and I do pay for, and I have had it for at least four or five years, maybe. I want to say as long, almost as long as I've had an iPhone. And I started with, what, version four or five of iPhone. So, and I, what caught my eye is because Space Boy is an independent music artist. I thought maybe this would be something we need to keep our eye on. They say Spotify is trying to lure artists into licensing their music directly on Spotify by offering advances and really appealing business terms to independent artists to try to convince them to go ahead and directly license their music to the Spotify streaming service instead of going through this some third-party distribution service that puts it on Spotify for you. So like I guess Spreaker is going to do with this podcast or broadcast rather. So you mean, yes. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. But, yeah. So they're going to, um, they've promised artists and their management several hundred thousand dollars as an, in bet, as an advanced fee for agreeing to license with a certain number of tracks by their independent acts. So I guess if you've got, assuming record labels are still a thing, hmm. I don't know if they are. If they've got independent artists, Spotify wants to go directly to them and license their music instead of them having to go through whatever processes they've normally been through. Right. So in some cases, they're, um, Spotify's offering 50% cut per stream royalty rates. Hmm. Do you understand what that means? Can you explain it? Well, I mean... Uh, you get 50% of a royalty? I guess for so. For each stream? For, for each stream. Somebody yeah. streams, you know. Uh, that should be more money. I'd have to look at their, you know, the yeah. fine details, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I'd love to get my, you know, all my catalog back up on Spotify. Um, he says that's less than a percentage major album labels earn, but artists end up with a significant smaller portion of those label royalties. So Spotify 
their proposal could be more enticing to the artist because I guess you'd also be completely in charge of your own stuff, right? Instead of going there. Now, here's what they're saying. Indie musicians also often license their music through Apple, Spotify, or TuneCore. Yeah, I do the TuneCore. Well, at least I used to do TuneCore a lot. Spotify says they're going to cut that out, out, which I guess you could call them the middleman. Mm -hmm. They cut them out of the picture and they'll let you, let's say, they'll let Space Boy license your music to Spotify and while retaining the full revenue from those deals. There's no exclusivity involved. And I think you could still put your music on other platforms, maybe. Mm -hmm. So they're they're probably going to limit these attractive terms to only popular acts that well, they know that they're going to make money on. Um, I guess we'll see. Because, you know, it's all about the big C, content. So if, uh, you know, if... Spotify can draw all those people in because let's face it, if you want to, an exclusive artist or, or big big paying artist or whatever, go to Title because T that yeah that, T I D A L yeah, yeah they they only do like the, the big name acts and they were created by big name acts so people like the indie artists such as myself or um, Jay Z uh, uh, or, or, or Jeff um um from i i can't i'm gonna butcher his last name and i i'm really gotcha. well but, the big ones out there are are apple music spotify mm -hmm. title and i just read a a, a, a headline that pandora is going to start offering a 15 dollar a month service i'm like who cares <laughs> jeff mccall is who i was thinking of yeah yeah but i mean you know uh, uh, right off the bat, uh, you know, you can find, well, it used to be able, since I've scaled back and I've taken my music off of TuneCore, um, it's not being pushed out there before. So it's kind of like right now, the best way to get any of my music Here's is to go to. Maybe as, an, as a musician, you could understand. Of course, I know you had different criteria. If you've got an album and it's on Spotify and all the albums there, cool. And then, but you also have a YouTube channel and you have the same album, but you have some extra songs. They're on the album, but they're not on Spotify. And I would love, like, yeah, but I like that one song. It's not on your album, and it's not on Spotify where I can get it all together, all your music together in one place and play a big playlist. That's what irritates me. I'm like, why don't you have that on Spotify? But I guess artists have their reasons. I guess they do. Um, but, um, you know, we'll ponder that over the next few minutes here. Um, let's see. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, yeah, let me wrap this up by saying that uh, um, a big reason why I don't do the tune core anymore because, uh, you know, I'm not, it's not that I'm not pro money. It's just like for iTunes, I, I would upload it to maybe streaming services so that you could take stuff to go, make it more easier to listen versus paying for my music in the sense of, you know, um, Paying like you know, hey, I'll pay you ten dollars for this album because that's not the intentions of what I'm trying to do right so now. So you didn't put it on Spotify because you're not trying to monetize it. Yeah, I'm not. Well, I because I took it down a lot of that music down and didn't renew it. It pretty much did it across the board where it took all the music down yeah. from the various things. So uh, I, at some point, I'll Does probably Spotify get still free. I'll probably get that music up there um, at different spots where people I can miss listen having to. your music on Spotify for my convenience. Well, it it should be coming back soon. It's just a matter of uh, planning that out and and getting that up there. It's all about what I want. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> I'm just looking at the clock now. Well, I guess we can go ahead and, and go to break, and hopefully we'll have our, our guest on, uh, Quentin and um, um, Hillary uh, Thomas uh, Oliver will be on from the group Pony Trap, and we're going to talk music tonight. Um, great band from Austin, Texas, and they have a, just a, a, a crazy unique style of music in combination. It should be for good evening because you know how when we have husband and wife teams on mm -hmm. the universe, uh, how it kind of just kind of rotates all the way around with us. So don't go anywhere unless you're going to go get a beverage or uh, make a pit stop, you know, at your favorite place like Bucky's. And uh, we'll be right back after this. This is Patrick Scott Spore, and you're listening to Space Boy Universe.
You are listening to Space Boy Universe on the SVU Network. Explore the universe with Space Boy and Sir Lada. This is author Gordon Root. You are listening to the Space Boy Universe. This is K-28, and I'm listening to Space Boy Universe. Hi, y'all. This is Lori calling from Texas, and I love listening to Space Boy Universe. Hey, this is Dave Cruz, host of Beyond the Strange, and you're listening to Space Boy Universe. This is Wendy. I'm listening to Space Boy Universe. Hey, y'all. This is Lorelai DeLille. I listen to Space Boy Universe. Don't you? Tell your mom and them I said hi. The Austin Chronicle said this about our next guest. If our post-industrial dystopia needs a soundtrack, Pony Trap can help. Overlaying dark cello and viola against waves of thundering percussion, the result is a uniquely futuristic 
classical score of dark rhythms and haunting mechanics. And I was like, I'd like to know more. So tonight, <laughs> Hillary and Quentin Thomas Oliver, they are the only two warm-blooded members of the band Pony Trap. Their, mu- their rhythm section is an assemblage of analog program robots, including two floor toms and a 12-foot-tall human-shaped tower of drum heads. And there's much, much more you can learn about them on PonyTrapMusic.com. And a lot of it, uh, I didn't feel like we should just be read, and we're just going to ask them right now. So welcome, Quentin and Hillary. Hi. Hello. We're happy to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. Um, you know, it's pretty exciting. Now, uh, I guess, has it been about two weeks since we talked to you, Quentin, the last time? Or about a week and a half? Or it's been a, 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 a I, Right on two weeks or so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so we had such a wonderful time. And, of course, uh, uh, Serlana uh, chastised me saying, uh, w- why weren't you recording this? You know, it was good stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and and I was like, oh, well, Quentin, just come on the live show. We'll have a good time. And uh, we'll act like we haven't even had a pre-interview. And, uh, well, two weeks have gone by. He's probably forgotten all that. Yeah, so anyway, I, I'm just excited and tickled pink to, to get uh, get both of y'all I on too, tonight. because we didn't get to talk to Hillary yeah. now. Hillary is the other half of this setup, but she's also the wife. So it's kind of like, well, we got going here. So I would like to focus on her a little bit, her background. Did she get roped into this? Like I got roped into this or did she go in willingly? Was it your idea, Hillary? Give us the background to your endeavors. Um, well, I, I have a kind of a, by the seat of my pants musical background um my both of my parents are musicians my mom's a singer uh so i grew up with music in the house um and i played a little cello in school in like middle school and elementary school and then dropped it after after i went to high school uh and picked up the guitar and did a little singing and just a little of this and a little of that but nothing too serious and nothing professional um and by the time quentin and i got together uh I had been listening to his music in different formats, a couple of different uh, uh, endeavors that had other human beings involved (laughs) um, that were playing his songs. It was really, really fun to hear his music. And and then there there came a breaking point where he just decided he didn't want to deal with people at all anymore. And he was going to make robots to be in his band so he didn't have to have other people. Uh, he was done with people. Um, sounds diabolical. Like, oh, cool. all right. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds awesome. I can't wait to see where this goes. And, and you know, I was like, kind of, I, I didn't really take it that seriously, um, but I should have known better because Quentin's a, Quentin means what he says. So, and the next thing he knew, I knew he had, um, he had gone off and bought an Arduino chip and was learning how to make lights blink on and off. And that was when I realized he was serious. Well, I so, like that. And, sorry. Uh, uh, let me interject, yeah. Solana, because this is a good time, you know, uh, as the husband of our our husband and wife team uh, here. Um, so when he said something, to, you know, I'm going to build robots because <laughs> I, I can't stand humans. That I can't get exactly what I want from humans. Uh, was it one of those moments that you had like, um, yes, dear, and pat him on the sho- shoulder and, and just kind of, you know, you know, let's see what happens. Or was it like, oh, my God, he's building Skynet. <laughs> It was mostly, I, it, to me, it seemed to be an expression of his frustration. Like, <laughs> I felt really bad that, that he was having such a difficult time realizing this musical dream that he had. And he, he had gotten to the point where he just wanted to do it all himself and build robots to do what he couldn't do. And I was like, you poor thing. I'm so sorry that it's gotten this to this place for you. Um and so I just thought it was a little bit of um, hyperbole, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and so when he actually started working on the project, I, my mind was completely blown. Uh, and I, I'm pretty amazed with how far uh, we've been able to get, um, not really having a background in either robotics or drumming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what we set out to do, of course, was build robot drums. Um, and that's... And that's exactly what we that's why they want you at Maker Fairs because you know you went from not knowing anything to teaching yourself and now you're the hot stuff. So I think that's very, very cool. So Quentin, 
you you had a specific vision so so to speak it's more audio but i know of a or rather a sound or a rhythm and you weren't getting it from yourself or from other humans you're like well i'll just i'll have to program something was it always going to be a program with something hitting a stick or did you say well, well I'm, we might as well make it more of a, a show and have it be like a robotic thing you can look at or what was your impetus for that well for yeah, there's, there's kind of a, a couple of things there. Um, first off, yeah, it was very much like, you know, for better or worse, and, and it, everybody, of course, all you can do with your art is you just put it out there and let people judge it. But for, for whatever that's worth, like, kind of my whole adult life has revolved around this sound, this idea of music that I had in my head, this sort of really industrial tribal thing but uh on a classical instrument um i learned to play viola to do this and um it that ended up taking me through music school and and ended up you know making my life as a as a violist as a classical musician which i never foresaw going into this because i was in my 20s when i picked it up um so that part of it was was really just having an idea that I could that I could never get realized. And, and a lot of the parts of that were, there, there were over the course of the, the years of putting this together and, and fits and starts and stops and more fits, uh, you know, there were lots of people involved. And some of those were even really good collaborations where we were really getting something uh, that, that was hitting, hitting uh, on the, the, the thing I was shooting at. Um, you know, like anything, that, that stuff falls apart the way it does. People move away or, you know, one of the things I ran into a lot was, you know, somebody that, that wants to, that loves playing stuff in 13 and doing some of the kind of math rocky or classical kind of stuff that we do, then is it satisfied that 80% of everything else we're doing is four on the floor, straight ahead industrial music. And then, you know, the kind of drummers generally that are playing that sort of pop, 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 blast beat kind of industrial music don't really want to break out for like three measures of 13 in the middle of nowhere. So, it, <laughs> you know, aside from, from just when I would find somebody, maybe it just didn't last for various reasons and, or just not being able to find people who wanted to do that thing. Um, so that's where I just kind of ended up. And, and, and there's a really fun story about that transitional moment. And Hillary was actually there uh, was South by Southwest. So I always get the year wrong, 2010. 2011. 2011. <laughs> uh, we're gonna get him a tattoo. Hillary I for the rip. save. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was South by 2011, and and there's people involved, and and we're playing some of my tunes, but we're playing some other tunes, and it's, it's sort of morphing into this kind of freeform jazz slash singer songwriter thing, and which is real, real far away from where I wanted mm -hmm. to be, and we were in the middle of. Uh, of a, a 30 minute freeform jazz thing. Uh, and I was, I was dying. That's, and, and this is some people's thing. And, and I'm not coming out of the gate trying to insult who, whoever that is, their thing. But it's not my thing. Uh, it's strongly not my thing. And, uh, I agree I, with I, you. I really, really strongly <laughs> not your thing. I was, I was giving him a hard time beforehand that I was going to make a bunch of Stuart Small, or no, uh, Derek Small's jokes, you know, Spinal Tap, freeform <laughs> jazz, obviously. Uh, like, no, it's supposed to be Spinal Tap, then Puppet Show. And the people that wanted me to do a 30-minute freeform jazz obviously didn't think that was so funny. <laughs> but I, I got about five minutes into taking it seriously, and it was just ridiculous. And I ended up with an empty beer bottle banging on the glockenspiel for about 15 minutes of that just because I couldn't think of anything else to do that, that would artistically express how I was feeling at the moment. <laughs> and that was the thing. That was the final moment of like, yeah, there's, there's, I'm not, I'm not doing this with anyone else anymore. Um, and then coming kind of back around to the, the second part of that, uh, it was always going to be drums. And for me, uh, I really wanted a physical presence. Like I, I built my drums in a lot of ways to be anthropomorphic, uh, even the ones that, that, that I intentionally was trying, you know, to stay away from them looking like people, um, you know, they've got two big arms and they kind of have a, you know, sort of R2-D2 shape to them. Uh, so there's a, hopefully a nice balance of, of mechanics and, and anthropomorphism to them. Um, 
but it was always going to be drums and it was always going to be written notation just because that's how I think about music. Uh, so the, a lot of things about it have evolved, but that idea that it would be physical and sort of one of the things I ran into as I started kind of trying to figure out how to make musical robots, uh, a lot of musical robots are kind of, they're small, they're really technical and they do a lot of really cool things, but they're small, you know, you got to plug them into something or you've got to have lights flashing to show you what's moving and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And a huge part of where I wanted to start was I wanted it to, to make physical sounds. Like you don't need amps, you know, you need earplugs for our mm -hmm. drugs. And, uh, and I wanted it to be real visually obvious what's happening. You know, I didn't want to have to kind of walk up to it and poke at it and make sure it wasn't just a, uh, you know, a puppet with a recording inside of it or whatever. Um, so the, the <laughs> wasn't it Teddy Ruxpin? It, <laughs> <laughs> right. We didn't want toys. We mm -hmm. wanted Tech. workhorses. Mm -hmm. We we really needed machines that to do the job. Uh, we saw this. Um, we went to a museum together in Colorado and saw an installation that was um, little like wooden blocks and little small drums, a small snare, a tambourine. And they were kind of arranged in a circle, and each one had a little arm that would hit it. And uh, they just kind of went around in a circle and played these drums. And it was a very small sound, and it was very pretty, and it was very cute and toy-like. And I think the first words out of Quentin's mouth when we walked in the room and kind of watched it play a little bit was, I can do better. <laughs> uh, like, you had this vision in your head of what that could be and you could see the distance between the toy in front of us and like the workhorse that you needed uh to create mm -hmm. uh and i i just I, I have nothing but faith that whatever he decides he wants to do quentin can accomplish he just figures it out one of my favorite things about him I'm talking about you like you're not here. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Quinn, don't feel oh, bad because I get that all the time. I sit by Sir Lana at home oh, when I get hey, home from work. she's <laughs> saying nice things. What would he have to complain about? <laughs> Do continue, Hillary. Sorry. <laughs> One of my favorite, and this is something I tell everybody who who is who expresses even the remotest interest in how I feel about my husband. My favorite thing about him is that he looks at the world. And he sees its potential. Like he, Aww. he sees what things could do, and not what they're designed to do. And um, we, he, he pretty regularly goes into an auto zone or uh, any auto parts store looking for relays and stuff for the drums, and blows the minds of the people working behind the counter because he's like, "I'm looking for a relay," and they're like, "All right, uh, what?" the year making model <laughs> actually that's not kind of really not where we're going with this we're building robots um he he, he can he walks into an auto parts store and he sees musical instruments and that's a beautiful thing about my husband mm -hmm. oh i love you <laughs> Oh, what a tender moment. See, that's that's people that love each other. Yeah. yeah. I look at the world and I look, think, how punchable are these oh, things? Oh, I thought for secondary, it was like, I look at the world and I wonder how I can burn it down. And, mm -hmm. yeah. But, the you know, it, initially when I, uh, you know, when you were talking about the robots, I thought about this band, I don't know if you've heard of them, called Compressor Head, um, where they're basically a bunch of robots and they play, I guess they play actual instruments, uh, guitars and and drums, and I, I just found that fascinating. And I know that you your setup is a little bit different, but uh, um, it was just one of these. Uh, it, the band is out of, I guess it's a Berlin based artist at uh, yeah. where they've got these, this group, and it's really phenomenal for me. Uh, you know, being that I have this persona of of, of space and exploring and robots and aliens and stuff uh, as kind of a general theme in my show. Uh, especially in, also into my own personal music, um, you know, it's just really cool to see when you can take technology like you're doing and and, and make it to where it, it's like the future is now kind of situation and using this technology. Would you care to elaborate a little bit while we still have a little bit of time in this part of the hour to uh, go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about that technology? About how the, the technology that I'm using and how it works? Yes. Or just the... 
general well, idea with technology. Well, how did you know? Uh, from okay, you say okay. I, there's a sound I want. I'm going to have to make program it. And so, how did you know to go to Arduino? And how did how did you? What was your whole process to get these bots? There, there's some there's some really uh, uh, fun, interesting uh, roads and side roads and, and dead ends in that. Um, I, I didn't know the first thing about uh, anything about how to make stuff move. I didn't know how I would how I would teach it the music I wanted. I didn't know how I would eventually make it move uh, any of that stuff. And I uh, uh, Hillary actually said I got this real smart friend, uh, Sean Dunn. Mm-hmm. I always like to say his name because I just think he deserves credit out there. And uh, and I just exchanged some emails with Sean and said, boy, you know, the first thing you ought to look into is Arduino. If you can write a little bit of software, mm. uh, it's a great way to move forward. You know, if you can get if you can get software moving, and then the Arduino can help you make things actually move. And that was a, you know just that email exchange, and we bounced a whole bunch of other ideas around and stuff, and all the rest of it ended up just kind of being uh, uh, clouds, but. But that one thing really stuck, and, and that was the big linchpin, like finding the Arduino and then, then make the mice blank and then making a motor move. And even there, that was a moment. So, you know, I had an Arduino, and I was making my lights blank, and I actually had the primary, the core of the software written that is still the software that runs it today um, that would read the music and grab the music from a, from a digital page and, and turn it into ons and offs. But I couldn't make a motor move. I didn't know. One of the things I've learned over and over again, you know, in life, but especially on this, is like a huge part of the problem isn't getting an answer. It's, it's understanding how to ask a question. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went to I went to some robot group stuff, and this is how I didn't even know there was a maker community at this point. I didn't know that was a thing people did. Uh, and so I, you know, I found the robot group here in Austin and went there and started. Uh, uh, just conversations with them about, you know, how do you make things move? And one of the interesting parts of that was, um, and the, and this as a theme would come up over and over and over again, but this specific first model was really great. One of the guys in the robot group, in fact, the first guy I talked to, had been for years uh, like a mechanic, or I don't know what you would call him, you know, the guy who keeps up the Chuck E. Cheese band. Right. It's funny you segue into that. I, 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 you know, that's what's in my mind right now. Yeah. So, um, I think, I think you, but you came back, you came home from that meeting and you were like, okay, so the weirdest thing that happened to me tonight was some guy took me out to his car and showed me like parts of the robots from the Chuck E. Cheese band. And I was <laughs> so jealous. Yeah. Uh, well, that's yeah. not creepy at all. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, weird. Totally awesome. It's like it's a like Five Nights at Freddy. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, where do you think they got that from? They got it from the Chuck right? Cheese band. Because it scares people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we started talking to, to, to people who do things sort of like the thing we need to do. Uh, and we, we discover that there's this gulf between hobby robots and heavy duty industrial Mm -hmm. robots. And there's not a, there's kind of a wasteland in between that. You can make, it's real easy to find everything you need to make a toy robot. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's really, really expensive, but not that hard to find the parts and the knowledge to make a heavy-duty industrial robot. But in between, there's kind of not much out there, not a lot of resources, uh, not a lot of just, like, open-source knowledge, uh, which mm. was what we were kind of looking for. Um, we got a lot of interesting advice. Like, people were saying, well, for power, you're going to want to use pneumatics because uh, you oh, want right, something. Right. Every Everyone told us this. Because the, the parameters we outlaid where we want it to be mobile, we want it to be powerful, and we want it to be off the shelf. We don't want to have to make any custom parts or custom tools or any of that nonsense. We, we need it to be pretty easy to work on. Uh, and so everybody said, you got to use pneumatics for the power, and you got to use MIDI uh, for the control. Because that's just what it's for. MIDI is designed mm-hmm. to help control. people make digital music. Uh, but we didn't know anything about MIDI or pneumatics. And we, we, we tell this story over and over again, but it's really, really, like the things that we know how to do, we understand 12-volt systems, 
because we're hillbillies and we work on our own cars. <laughs> and, 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 you know, Quentin's been through music school, so he understands notation. Uh, so we built a 12-volt system powered robot that reads music, uh, and it's all Arduino-based, and the code is written in Visual Basic 6. Uh, it is old-school dinosaur code that's very elegant and, uh, and just does exactly what we needed to do. Because that's what Quentin knows how to write. So we, we, we decided before we hauled off and tried to learn a whole new thing and thus delayed the start of our project, we just decided to see how far we could get with what we already knew how to do. And it turns out we can get pretty dang far. Uh, we have, you know, two amazing uh, R2-D2 floor toms that scare real drummers and uh, a 12-foot tall robot made out of drum heads who is the coolest thing I mm -hmm. personally have ever laid eyes on. I can't imagine the level of satisfaction you both must get when you're performing, you got your creation around you and, you know, I mean, like every bit of you is plus, on that plus stage. You don't have to worry about other humans and you, mm -hmm. you've got it divas. all mapped out. Yeah. Divas. I mean, you other than each other. Yeah. Like they don't, the, the robots aren't going to, aren't going to decide they want to sing or form right? a union uh -huh. or, they're, you know, <laughs> they're not going to fight for creative control. They're, <laughs> or do they freeform jazz. <laughs> Right. They, they don't have opinions, and that's our favorite thing about them. Uh, so, yeah, we're getting exactly, exactly what we want out of them. And, like, one of the things I've discovered, it's sort of my personal sweet favorite moment about these robots. Uh, like, if we are going to a school and doing a demonstration, or if we're just showing them off for friends, or if we go and we play a show, the, my favorite part is the very first moment when the drums hit because it's incredibly loud and everybody jumps out of their seat and it's my favorite thing <laughs> I, I, I look out and i'm like yes we just scared an entire room of people and that was exactly what i wanted it was incredibly satisfying <laughs> that's well, awesome so uh, uh hold it hold it hold it we're at the top of the hour here let's take our break well we got uh quentin and hillary thomas oliver of the uh, I guess the dynamic duo of the, the group, of, yeah, Pony Trap music. And when we come back, we'll we'll have some more conversations with them. And so, don't touch that dial. Explore the universe with Space Boy and Sir Lana. Hey, Sir Lana! What? If Space Boy Universe was cheese, would you eat it? Uh... Come on now, it's a simple question! Maybe? Spaceboyuniverse.com <laughs>
you are listening to Space Boy Universe. Here are your hosts, Space Boy and Sir Ron. All right. You know, it's always a great conversation off air uh, when we have some guests and, uh, I mean, just right, Sir Lana, when we have guests, mm-hmm. it, it, it's inevitable we have some great conversations off air. And um, so w- I guess we were talking and, uh, you know, Quentin, it was reminding me of, you know, when you brought up uh, the Chuck E. Cheese thing, <laughs> I was like, you know, personally, I've been wanting to do a music video of something on that lines of Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, surprisingly, when I was younger, I worked at Chuck E. Cheese, and um, it was always fascinating to watch the, the band play, and I, I love the technical aspect of all that, and, um, you know, and it's really, you know, out of the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago, and, and talking about it tonight, it's kind of got my mind, like, I felt like I'm having a Doc Brown moment where he slips and bumps uh-huh. his head, and it's like he comes up with the idea of the flux capacitor. So I, I, it's kind of giving me ideas. Not that I'm like going to move in on your territory. It's just for, oh, you're safe. Don't worry. Yeah, it's just <laughs> just ideas that I have of of hey, that would make a great music video or this. You know, um, I'm not looking to like uh, um, build anything like you have, which is just totally awesome. And um, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, you know your your journeys and your technical aspects and and um, and how you've gone to these meetups and uh, other fascinating stories along the way? Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, like Hillary was saying before the break, and, and you were just alluding to uh, uh, meeting the Austin Robot Group and talking to those guys. First off, they were just so cool and so welcoming right off the bat. And that has been my experience throughout sort of discovering and now I'm you know now I'm deep in it I'm in Wisconsin this whole kind of maker community thing um, but it was always my experience that that everywhere we went everybody we talked to was happy to share knowledge and and happy to help and and excited for each other's progress on on different things and that's been a really fun part of the community and you know even kind of coming back to what you said like I would gladly tell you how to do what I'm doing and, and you can do whatever you want with that um, uh, so anyway, we we met met these guys and 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 uh, got to go out to the car and see some eyeballs from a Chuck E. Cheese robot. <laughs> uh, and, and again, you know, that's the very first thing. It's always it's always uh, uh, pneumatics, 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 and everybody I talked to pneumatics, 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 and I just couldn't wrap my head around how that was going to work into our portable thing, you know, because you've got to have a compressor and it's going to be really loud and, uh, and there's just a lot of stuff. And again, you know, coming back to what Hillary had already mentioned, I was dead set from the beginning that it was going to be off the shelf. You know, I didn't want to build a giant custom system. Um, so it was another friend, um, uh, another engineer type friend I had been around talking to people I actually <laughs> in, in my adventures and, and I met through the robots groups uh, a guy whose father used to work for NASA and he's this sort of kind of wild genius that lives out in the hill country uh, uh, by himself a little bit it's just a really really fun interesting guy and heavy, so heavy on the wild <laughs> good wild guy man smart dude and, yeah. and anyway so I, I drive way way out into the hill country to his house and I'm just like hey help me make things move and and we spend a day together it was ultimately fruitless but he was just fascinating amazing and he showed me all his stuff and one of the coolest parts of that adventure was like i actually got a, a hold of my hands and open up the uh the operator's manual the owner's manual for a space shuttle oh wow <laughs> <laughs> i know right it's, it's just totally unexpected it, it's all typewritten you know and it's glue bound uh and it, and each chapter is signed by like an admiral and you know somebody from nasa and, and a pilot or whatever um and it's just way lower tech than you think it's going to be and it's exactly what an operator's manual should be you know it's like here's how you move the seat here's how you buckle your buckle here's how the jet engine works <laughs> um so that was pretty fun, and I was in, 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 but it was it was a fun day, but it was also wicked frustrating because I walked out of there with no new knowledge and no no idea how to further myself. And I, I have this uh, a friend who's actually a, a professional engineer. It's what he does, and and, uh, and I had asked him for a little help here and there, and he just didn't have time. I called him on the way back, and I was just like, buddy, 
I need an hour of your life and I've got to have it because I can't, I can't move forward on this project. And he was like, what's your thing? And I said, I've got code, I've got this Arduino, and he didn't even know what an Arduino was, but he knows what a PIC is, what a programmable chip is. Mm-hmm. You know, he knows, like, he could build an Arduino, but he didn't know that somebody had. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the thing. And uh, uh, he was like, I said, I've got that, I've got lights blinking, I need to, how do I turn these lights blinking into turning a motor, into firing a motor? He was like, Dad, give me a minute. And, like, <laughs> that night, he emailed me a, a spec. Uh, he emailed me a... a, a Oh, a, a visual image. There's a word for it. I'm, I'm losing it. But anyway, he, he uh, emailed me. A circuit? Yeah, he, he emailed me a circuit, I guess. Uh, but it was a picture circuit. Um, and there's a company that does that. And they have a name. And I'm getting stuck on that. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> and that, to this day. Welcome to life with my husband. <laughs> to this day, that, that's how the thing works. You know, what he sent me was the Arduino turns on a MOSFET. And then you've got to do some things with that, right? You've got to, you have to have a diode in there so it doesn't get back current. You've got to ground it properly, and then, you know, so the Arduino turns on the MOSFET, which switch, you know, but I didn't know that. I didn't know what one was. Uh, and then that switch, once I've, got, once I've got hot power coming through that, hot 12-volt power, then I can rely on my good old school backyard mechanic stuff. Because if, if I've got a switch I can turn on and off that gives me 12-volt power, now the world now knows. We're off the yeah. <laughs> so, so then I'm turning on relays and, and, and making things move from, from that perspective. And then it became time to solve the problem of what is the actual mechanism we're going to use to right. make things move? Like, we've got the power. Now what's the mechanism? And we tried all kinds of things. We tried gears, uh, but gears, we're, we're running so much power, the gears were stripping. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we couldn't afford metal gears, so we were, like, buying plastic gears from the hobby airplane shop and just blowing them up, just like, yeah. exploding them. Turning them into wheels. Yeah, <laughs> pretty quickly. We were running a wheel factory out of our apartment. <laughs> uh, and, and so you were, like, sitting there with a kick drum pedal yeah. in your hands, just, like, absently pushing on the pedal and watching the little mallet come down. And you're like, how am I going to get these? Like, what's the mechanism I'm going to use? And then it's like right there in your head. Right, I was literally holding it, yeah. Uh, and that was the breakthrough moment was we run a chain of some kind from the end of the mallet, uh, and it wraps around the motor. Like it's a spinning motor, attach a spindle to it, yep. tie a shoestring through the spindle and put it on the other end of the mallet, and boom, <laughs> It's a kick drum pedal. That's the that's the solution. Yeah, and so turn the whole thing. Yeah, it totally works exactly like that. It's just so simple and uh, and perfect. And even that had its sort of comical, like like you know, explosions and, and whatever. So, oh man! And, yeah. and again, that's but that's the system that's worked to this day. That's exactly how it still works. Yeah. But like you know, we had the hardest time getting the spindle to stay on and I was trying all sorts of wildness. I was trying to drill through those things and yeah. you know, find any kind of connectors and in the end, like the dumbest, weirdest thing was what solved it. We got PEX and heated it up and, you know, so we got plumbing tube and and plumbing clamps and that ended up solving that problem pretty yep. good. Uh, there was another funny uh, uh, offshoot on the way to power. So once we had once we had it moving, once mm-hmm. we had power going through these MOSFETs and I had hot switches I was still not sure how how, I, how much power um, I could get and a, yet another friend uh, who's a mechanic and he has this sort of kingly garage his garage I believe is literally bigger than his house yeah and he uh, built it himself he built it himself and he builds race cars and, uh, and just a cool interesting uh, smart dude but who was also really pushing us to do pneumatics and yeah. I was like no uh, <laughs> and he was like, no, but look at my potato gun. It's so awesome. <laughs> um, this is, that's, it's actually it, a very awesome potato, awesome potato gun. gun. <laughs> uh, it's like, duly oppressed, but I'm still not doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was it was uh, Joe who taught me uh, about amperage, which was I, a thing I didn't know. Like, I had a, a pretty good, again, backyard understanding of how like I can hook up a starter and I can take a battery in and mm-hmm. out of the car and I can even set the points on an old car and that kind of stuff. But real detailed knowledge of electricity I didn't have. And so Joe taught me about amperage and voltage and, and you know, how, how power works. 
uh, you know, so you can push 12 volt through it, but like it's only going to draw. And, and he taught me this by like, and this was funny because we blew all our fuses and we had to send you, like, called you up. And I'm like, yeah. hey, we're in the middle of the thing. Could you go by AutoZone and bring us some 20 amp fuses? Like, uh, and you duly, because you, you're awesome. And I just gave them to you and turned around and left. I was yeah, like, you yeah. boys have fun. It was like mom <laughs> delivering. Yeah, hilarious. So, and, uh, uh, yeah, we, he he's proven to me how amperage works. But we're taking these tiny little motors and just hooking them straight up to car batteries. Oh man, <laughs> I'm horrified uh, and also fascinated. And then that also ends up being yeah. okay. Yeah. Like what I don't need to do, what I had anticipated at that point was like, okay, now I'm turning on 12 volt stuff, so I know how a bunch of this works. I'm going to use that to turn on something else. It's like no. <laughs> I'm hooking up car batteries and put fuses on them. I'm not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and again, like that ends up being how it all works, right? So it's it's Arduino turns on a MOSFET. MOSFET turns on or yeah, uh, uh, activates a relay like it's just a, a old school physical uh, electromagnetic relay, and that relay is literally connecting a car battery to a power drill motor, mm -hmm. and that's that's the system. Oh. And so all of this. Is the result of yeah. <laughs> experimentation first and foremost, perseverance. Like you just weren't going to let this go. This was That's not going to be a ask. failed. Figure this out and leveraging the smart, cool, interesting people in our circle uh, and and picking their brains about how do I do this? What's what's the shortest path between A and B? And then we proceeded to take the very long way. Uh, <laughs> That's about to so say there, what. It seems like, okay, you're a musician, you're creative, like, I have this idea, I know exactly what I want, but in order to get there, I am going to be thrown into a whole field of technology and mechanics that I'm not familiar with, you know, maybe in computer programming, and then you seems like you'd figure out one thing, and you're like, okay, here's the next roadblock, so what kept you going, like she said, perseverance, but you're like, I am not giving up, and did you have, like, huge gaps of time between you know, maybe these little hiccups or, I mean, I'm just like, I know for me, I'd be like, screw it. And I'd be thrown all on the floor or out in the backyard. <laughs> I, I can answer part of that question. And part of that, part of the answer to that question is that it wasn't so much the case that we would solve one problem and then work on the next problem for a long time without progress. It felt like there was a teeny tiny little bit of progress every day. Yeah. Like it was very incremental uh, and iterative. We were we were getting better at it every single time we tried, and we worked on it all the time. And so while there were breakthrough moments, it was really like a, a, a line on a graph just gradually rising and rising and rising. It never really plateaued, I didn't feel like. I felt like even when we weren't making progress on the drums, we were learning a ton. And approaching it from that perspective helped us not lose hope seems like the path yeah. to discovery uh you know it was a, a good one i mean uh as you all went along um i guess the way, you stayed intrigued long enough like okay let's keep learning hey, let's learn yeah, the next let's, thing. It's, it's working out you know we're you know we're moving forward and uh um that's that seems to be the the greatest uh path to you you pretty much know it's an so end positive. game. Yeah, it's so positive. <laughs> you know your end game. You know your end game, and you're making strides and headways. Uh, you know, um, it it must have been thrilling for you every step of the way as you're learning this technology. Absolutely. Yeah. Every every new thing that worked, or you know, even didn't break. You know, yeah. it's, it's that didn't break is often like you know one of the biggest successes. Right. Um, but yeah, it's always thrilling. It's always fun. Like, and, and it, you know, we, we were telling the story jokingly, but it literally happened yesterday when I dragged Hillary out to the yard and made her pat me on the back. <laughs> um, like, I, I'm work, you know, I'm working on a just kind of bigger, thumpier version of our machines, and and like, and it doesn't even work yet. It's just the framework. Like, I, I built this new frame, and it, it kind of goes up and down, and and it's a whole new thing. And you guys, just, it is pretty so. Exciting amazingly cool <laughs> it's so cool i can't, just can't wait for this thing to join us on stage it's just it's just amazing now uh, so we get to see that in october or is that going to be a special day uh, we're somewhere? hoping i oh, that's, that's 
the timeline on it is long. Um, my goal is to have it ready. But so like I was uh, uh, talking to Houston Maker Fair about premiering it there. So that's I hope, but I I couldn't promise. It's so, gonna depend on how much stuff breaks between now and then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how what what are we looking at here as far as uh, your typical setup? Uh, I mean, you have the both of you, but. Uh, do you have uh, you you know do you have your roadies? Do you I mean is there a lot of equipment that uh, I mean what's the time scale that it takes to get everything well, in place for a production? I'll talk to that specifically because that was also part of our our kind of spec at the beginning. Yeah, well, that was it was part of our design. Yeah. One of the things that was important to us was that it wasn't an all day project. Like it's not an install. Yep. Um. Uh. It's. It's all portable. It all fits in a pickup truck. Like, like we take everything that we have, and it's these two sort of, like I said, you know, I describe them as R2D2 sized. Uh, it's not like trash can size. Trash can sized mm-hmm. drums. And then this 12 foot tall guy who's, you know, shaped like a sick person. Um, <laughs> but everything breaks down small enough that a single person can carry it. A bit person. Um, uh, Quentin. A, <laughs> a single person can carry it. It all fits through the floor. And it all fits in the back of my pickup. So I've got a little camper shell on the pickup, and it all fits in that cubic, I don't know, that's got to be about 6 by 4 by 4 mm-hmm. um, And then the setup, it's it's a one-person job. It's probably, it's a, it's a hard work an hour mm-hmm. by myself. Mm-hmm. Um, with two of us, you know, it doesn't quite cut it in half, um, but it's maybe half an hour. And then, you know, it's all set up so that we can build it off stage and then, just literally wheel it on stage. Uh, and then, you know, we've got a hand or two. Like, I think one of the most amazing things, last year, South by Southwest, in uh, 2017, mm-hmm. uh, we got a job for National Geographic. And that was so cool. Um, they were premiering uh, the genius that Ron Howard did uh, about the Albert Einstein. They took over building downtown. And anyway, it was an amazing party. It was super fun. But the schedule's really tight. We're going on right after Ron Howard. Mm-hmm. So they're like, no, you're not standing off the side of the stage and building your stupid robot. <laughs> you're going to wait outside like everybody. Uh, so we were parked out back, but they had a crew, like a legit set of stage hands who know what they're doing and, and know how to you know, work with you and for you. And, and it was real, like super pro. Um, and yeah, with a, with a crew of people doing everything you tell them to, we were completely 100% broken down in the back of the truck. Like, everything's unbolted, everything's taken apart, everything's folded up into the truck. And, like, from the truck, half a block away in the parking lot, on stage, ready to go, was about 20 minutes. And that, that was pretty fun. Wow. Uh, so that's, that's probably about as fast as it can go, like, off the truck. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's built that I can do it, that I can load it, that I can drive it somewhere, and that I can set it up. Um, and as impressive as that is, it's even more impressive when you when you consider the fact that if any repairs have to be done, oh yeah, all of the, all the machines are designed so that all you need is hand tools yeah. to repair them. You don't need a drill, you don't need any kind of power. If you've got a screwdriver and a, a half decent set of wrenches, you're good to go. My and it's actually just sitting right in front of us. Uh, my on-site toolkit's like about the size of a fanny pack, because uh, again. Uh, hand, yeah, all off the shelf hand tools. It's, you know, it couldn't be more low tech. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say probably even your parts are gonna be pretty convenient too if it comes down to it. Yep. Yeah, you can get everything at an AutoZone or Home Depot. I, we I, actually uh, we did a um, a tutorial on how to build a robot drum for Make Magazine a couple of years ago. And the project maybe takes a long weekend and costs about $70. Yeah, something like that. And a kid can do it. With someone cutting the wood for them, the kid can do the rest. Hmm. And cool. you're building exactly what we have just on a smaller scale. Like, you iterate that, and you get exactly what we what we take on stage with us. And that's the thing we talk about a lot. Like, it's, in fact, it was just our plumbers were freaking out. We had plumbers <laughs> in the house the other day, and they're like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> I would still well, call Homeland Security. Right, yeah. <laughs> Just no, the the robot. Uh, uh, it's a good robot. Uh, but anyway, this is a thing that we talk about all the time. It's a small thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a few small things, and there's just a lot of them. And one of the things I discovered, and I never really thought too much about 
design in this way until this project. And, you know, I call it a project. It's like, I mean, we're going on years. It's now. a lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's how everything's designed. Yeah. Everything is a few small things. Yeah. And you've been done over and over and over and over again. And the, this, on is scale, a, yeah. this is maybe the source of what I consider to be Quentin's genius is that he can break he can break things down into that small part, their smallest mechanism. Uh, I, I can't see the world that way. I get bogged down in the details and I see something complex and I'm like, wow, that's really complex. And then I turn and walk away. And Quentin looks at it and solves the problem. Uh, and without that, I don't think we could have done any of this without that attitude and that way of looking at the world. Well, we I, took a lot of stuff okay. I was going to oh, say, man. I've, I've, I think the whole yeah. process has been really fascinating in how you, one, had a vision of what your needs were, um, and then two, how you broke things down, and, and then, of course, going into the fact that, uh, that um, hey, how can I make this simple enough to where we go click, 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 and bam, we're ready to go. Um, you know, that speaks volumes into your development process. That's what I want to know is kind of a backtrack. So I get if this is Quentin, if this was your idea, this vision to do that, your your uh, percussion accompaniment, Hillary, where were you in this whole process? Did he just say, "I'm going to have to build robots to do," and you're like patting him on the head, "That's nice, dear," and you do your own thing, or were you like, "Oh yeah, I get, let's do it." It's getting you get involved in that. I mean, where were you in that whole process? Uh, when he first decided to do this. He was living in Colorado, and I was living here in Austin. Mm. And so when you when you first made a light blink with your Arduino, I got to see it on cell phone video. You emailed me a cell phone video. Is I that right? Look what I did today. <laughs> and that was like a great fruit moment. That was the whole, that was the birth of yeah. this project, uh, was that light blinking on and off. And then maybe a few months later, you had moved back to Austin, and we were living together, and we had this little apartment, and... Slowly but surely, the robot project started taking over the apartment, and and I was delighted. Like some of the most fun that we had in this whole process was in in trying to figure out how to make things move. We took apart a lot of things that 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 move to see how they were put together. We were taking apart hedge clippers, yeah, and we were good. buying anything with wheels on it and that was radio controlled at Goodwill, and taking it home and taking it apart. And so we had the most fun destroying stuff in our apartment just to see how it was put together and how it worked. And we learned a lot from that. From And we pulled motors out of everything. And just, we became total scavengers. We were Jawas for a good long time. <laughs> grabbing, grabbing anything mechanical and taking it apart and salvaging what we thought we might be able to use later. Yeah. And so from the beginning, I was fascinated and really wanted to be a part of it. And I have deferred to Quentin on uh, how to actually do a lot of this stuff. But every now and then I'll be like, you know you're going to have to put a handle on that somewhere mm -hmm. to carry it. So before you take another design step, why don't we figure out where the handles are going to go so you don't design yourself into a corner and then don't have a handle. Right. And like simple things like that. Like he's thinking about the robot and I'm thinking about going to move this thing around. And it's just always easier to have two brains working on something. See, the at wife it brings different. clarity and reason, and you know. And and the Whereas husband, he's all chaotic and creativity. The, the husband brings the dream, and uh, you know. So, <laughs> okay. I'm, okay, okay, first off, don't feel like we're talking about y'all now because. <laughs> yeah, the really annoying dream. <laughs> I think in, in our, this relationship, those roles are reversed. He is very much the order creature. He is the he is the he is the order muppet and I am the chaos muppet in this relationship. Mm. And I, I think it's great that it works that way. And and how he has these wild chaotic ideas that he then imposes order on. And uh I I look at them and my perspectives are very scattered and maybe I get a little glimmer of an idea and I'm like, hey maybe we should try XYZ. And somehow all of that comes together and, and works really, really well. It's a wonderful partnership. And the, the thing I think that, like, Hillary is just the smartest person you're going to meet. Uh, she's just really, she sees things, sees things really clearly. Uh, and something I, I say all the time is, like, you're 
the fastest thinker I know. Like I will sit and stare at something until it falls apart, and that's kind of that's kind of my thing, and that can take a good while. And then Hillary will just walk up and be like, "Oh yeah, that should be over there," and I'm like, "Go, oh, <laughs> totally." Uh, uh, I love that. That it, that really inspires me to want to do better. I don't think I will, but I I like hearing this, and it's very um, positive. Yeah, it's very heartwarming. I'm glad that there's a good partnership like this that exists. A loving couple that uh, completes them uh, completes each other. Well, she wasn't suckered into something, <laughs> so she went into this like, yeah, let's do it. Hey, speaking suckered into, uh, we're at the bottom of the hour, so let's take our break. So we'll be right back with our uh, wonderful guest, uh, Pony Trap, Quentin and Hillary. So don't touch that dial. Explore the universe with Space Boy and Sir Lada. The epic battle begins this Friday, Friday, Friday. Direct from ringside at Laser Death Melt Pit. Bot versus Bot in Galaxy's Two Ton Weight Championship, where your challenger, Good Bot, will face the reigning champion, Bad Bot. You're terminated. Reserve seating starting at $30. Two drink minimum, where ladies don't get in free. This is an SBU production. You're listening to Space Boy Universe.
you are listening to Space Boy Universe. Here are your hosts, Space Boy and Sir Lonnie. Man, we are back, and uh, this evening is just blowing by, and it because you know it usually helps when we have guests, right, Sarah? Yes, and uh, they can do the talking. Uh, yeah, so but then we can ask the questions, and, and tonight is a very good night because we've got uh, Pony Trap, uh, Quentin and Hillary uh, Thomas Oliver, and uh, you know such great music. Uh, you know, I've seen uh, their videos online on YouTube, mm -hmm. um, and great uh, performance, and great performance. Yeah. So I want to get into the creative side of the music. Oh, yes, definitely. So I know Space Boy could probably ask some questions here. But so this is a original music coming from you both. Mm -hmm. So where does your inspiration come? Uh, are you directed now by your backup part of your band? Or is it just you write and they fit in where they need to fit in? Or, I mean, what's your creative process for your music? I do. For the most part, um, I, I write and they and they fit it, and I you know make them do the parts. You know that's mm -hmm. the nice thing about the robots is I can just think of a thing and they just do it. Uh, a really kind of trenchant example for that is I had this riff, uh, and it's funny because I didn't even realize it was in thirteen. I just kind of wrote this thing and didn't think too much about it, and, and was playing it, and it had a had a group that I really liked, and I sit down to start kind of working it out, you know, to make it fit for the robots. And it's like, oh, holy cats, that's in 13. Um, and it's da 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 And anyway, you know, all I've got to do for the robots is just, you know, write that music down and they do it. You know, it's not a it's not a process of like kind of coming backwards from four and where are the accents, you know, what what are my groups of three, what are my groups of two? I can just write it in. So that's pretty it's relieving, you know, and then I don't have to think about how, how am I going to translate that or how am I going to discuss it? Um, and that's really freeing. It means that I can just write whatever I want. You're cutting so the middleman cool. out. Yeah. You're cutting the middleman out. Cutting the man out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the man out for that. <laughs> <man>. <laughs> uh, but influence wise, like, there are a couple of big vectors for me, and one of them is early 20th century classical music. Like that, between the wars, uh, uh, you know, at the, at the at the end of at the end of traditional harmony at that late Romantic period, you know, when when uh, uh, Stravinsky starts really blowing things up, and <laughs> and Beethoven's already you know done some stuff around, uh, but before before Cage really takes over. Uh, and makes everything super weird. There's glorious stuff there that I just love. Um, you know, Hindemith is, is, I lean on him a lot uh, as a violist and a guy who wrote, you know, probably half of our viola repertoire. Uh, but Hindemith and Bartok and, and that kind of thing, that sort of really aggressive, oh my goodness, the whole world's going to fall apart classical music thing. Uh, I just, I love that. That's really my wheelhouse. Uh, and then, you know, I'm an 80s punk rock kid. So, oh, yeah. And I get into an industrial music from there. So, you know, I, yeah, I grew up listening to the Misfits and all that American hardcore stuff. And uh, and that led me into ministry. And then, you know, so prong and ministry and that kind of industrial metal thing. Uh, are my big sort of modern influences and modern is the wrong word for that because all that music is 30 years old now, but, <laughs> but those are the those are the kind of two big things for me is is modern you know early modern classical music and and industrial stuff but as far as percussion goes a lot of the influences that are working on us are things like kodo drummers from japan where it's mm -hmm. really driving at the there's a lot of personality and uh, force in that percussion. And then, um, again, to misuse the word modern, things like Adam Ant uh, and um, what was the other? There's another project that had the same drummer as Adam Ant. Oh, Bow Wow Wow. Bow Wow Wow. Mm -hmm. um, where I'm thinking about the drums on Good Two Shoes. They're really hard. They're just yeah. really in your face. And yeah really tribal and driving and thunderous, but also um, bright. Like, it's, 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 that's much more of a, uh, a happy vibe 
Yeah. Uh, and there's there's a, a, an interesting tension between the light and the dark. I oh, think. So in, are you a in, fan in, of? In what we end up. Are you a fan of In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins? Oh yeah. We've actually done a, a Phil Collins we cover. Have a, we have a Phil Collins tune, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's appropriate, because there's something about when those drums kick in, it's like your whole world changes. You're like, yes! You feel like you want to yeah. yeah. high-five the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we want to kind of freak everybody out. We want to freak the world out a little bit. <laughs> and then after the show, they're going to be interested in the high-five. But during the show, they might be a little scared. I like that's that. That's what we're I like that. <laughs> And even in the drums themselves, there's a really interesting interplay between fun and scary. Uh, they are fascinating machines, and kids love them. Mm-hmm. And then you turn up and everybody's terrified because uh, they are just crazy loud. They're so loud. If you got your hand stuck in there, you'd be pulling back a nub uh, or at least, you know, go to the ER with a broken bone. They are not messing around. Uh <laughs> They're not toys. They are definitely not toys. Um, and I love that. I love that they look really interesting and friendly and, and fascinating. But when, they, when they're when they working, you don't want to stand too close. Which that's what I was going to ask is the uh, the drum setup that you have. Is it a, is it a drum head or is it, is it just – how is that setup? I'm just curious. It's a – it's a floor tom. It's a floor tom like you'll see is in any other drum kit. It mm-hmm. has a traditional drum head on, so we tend to go through them a little faster than your average. <laughs> is, yeah, because I was wondering, you know, beat the crap out uh, of Yeah, my exactly. Bed. We've 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 done some repairs with duct tape in the past <laughs> uh, when needed because the quality of the sound isn't as important to us as the volume <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah, I imagine it's tough on them when you're you're at a uh, sound level eleven. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're hitting hard pretty much all the time. I mean, that's that's one of the things we don't do, and that that stems just from my my artistic direction. But we don't do a lot of subtlety. There's not a lot of dynamic. Yeah, we're not we're not genre. we're not pulling pulling off too much. We are just kind of hitting hard and going forward. Yeah. You no, know, Quentin mentioned. Uh, but yeah, but, you mentioned your 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 likes and of of uh, different uh, you know punk music and. Uh, ministry and and all that, uh, but uh, Hillary, we didn't quite hear some of your interest. I mean, how far does it diverge from what Quentin is, and where does it merge? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, pretty far, uh, as far as how what's the what's the distance between our musical influences? Mm-hmm. Um, in this in this band, I I am I am a machine that he can program. <laughs> I don't really. I don't have very strong opinions about what we're playing. I don't say no. Uh, I'm happy to be playing the music that he composes, and, and I don't really uh, put my own influence on that. Um, it is not music that I would ever create. Uh, I tend to, when I, when I write music, I write, I write music on guitar when I write, and it's sort of pretty... Uh, maybe a little sad. Uh, it's, it's high school girl music. Uh, <laughs> and you know, my, my influences growing up, my favorite bands, my favorite bands were REM and the police and the Indigo girls and Tori Amos, you know, like I like pretty harmonies and I like to sing along and that is not what we're writing. We are not <laughs> writing stuff you're ever going to sing along to. <laughs> but I, I love that. Like I love the challenge of, uh, getting to hear cool new stuff. Um, I love I love the music that Quentin writes, and I really love playing it. It is really fun to be on stage with my husband and our robots playing music. It is the coolest thing. And I can't I, wait to I see love it. it. I want to yeah, it's going to be it. awesome. I, I, this, I it's hope so. It's so exciting. So uh, you mentioned yeah. earlier that... Um, Basically, uh, y'all have uh, done, uh, I guess, Maker uh, Magazine, where you showed the uh, yeah the Make Magazine um, to to show how to, to create, uh, I guess, a setup for the youngsters out there. Uh, have you had an opportunity to go to a Maker Fair situation yet, or is this going to be a first one for you? 
We've done actually a bunch of them. That, that's, yeah. that's where we've performed more than any other setup. Uh, that's we, great. We though. did a maker. We did a I really love them. Oh, we so love them. and like we we never set out to be makers. We didn't set out. That wasn't part of our goal. We really just wanted to make a drummer to be the drummer in our band. That the band and the music was the sole source of focus for this project, and we just happened to fall into this amazing community of makers and people who do exactly what we did and go look at the world and see what it can do and not what it was designed to do and break stuff and put it back together in interesting ways to do something new. And and we are so fortunate and grateful to have found this family. We've done maker fairs in Georgia, in New York, in Austin, we do the Austin Maker Fair pretty much every year and mm-hmm. have for about the last like, year, five or six yeah, years. Yeah, I think it's five in a row. Or yeah. yeah and then uh, last year we went to the World Maker Fair in New York City, which was incredible. We saw the most amazing project, uh, fire-breathing dragons made out of metal and mm. uh, fully articulated ants that was about four feet long. It was gorgeous and uh, just some really incredibly cool stuff. Um, we went to, I think that was the first, the first Maker Fair we played was in Austin, wasn't it? Or was it the Georgia Maker Fair? No, Austin. Austin. And then I don't even know how they found us, but these people from the, the Macon, Georgia Maker Fair right. contacted us and, and brought us out to Georgia to, to play a set and talk about our drums. And that was the first time we'd left the state with our uh, that's music. probably true, yeah. And that was incredible. We had such a good time. We did the Mothership Maker Fair out in San Francisco. That's right. We brought our drums out to San Francisco and did the Bay Area Maker Fair maybe two years ago. Mm, wow. Two years. It was really cool. Yeah, was that really was awesome. a mind-blowing that, experience. That was like one of the, the coolest, most fortuitous, yes. everything just fell in line. Um, they had contacted us months before that to do uh, to do the... Oh, the sort of instructable, I keep calling it, but everybody hates that word. But anyway, yeah, yeah the sort the of tutorial. The, the tutorial, yeah. And um, uh, and, and they had they originally contacted us just uh, for the online magazine, and then the they really liked it, and they were going to put it in the print magazine, and then we had to ship them the, the little thing because the photos I took on my phone apparently aren't good enough to put in the magazine. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it, it a little robot. I was like, you jerk. Uh, it a little robot. And then uh, the email I get back is, oh, you know, this is awesome because it's going to be in the uh, in the issue that we're going to give away at uh, ba- the, the Bay Area yeah, Maker Fair. The big one, the original one. And they yeah. told us the dates, and we were like, oh, my gosh. Oh, wait a minute. We're going to be in California. <laughs> we, were, we, we had planned to go. We're big cycling nuts. And uh, for our honeymoon, we followed the Tour de France around France. It was incredible. And we were really hungry for a little injection of that kind of energy. And so we decided we'd take a vacation and go out to Florida and follow the end of California (laughs) and follow the tour of California and and watch some bikes go by. And so we were planning on being in that neck of the woods that day. Right. And so we changed our path slightly because we were going to drive out to California anyway. For this trip and we we just changed our pack so that we could fit a couple of robots in the car with all our stuff <laughs> and uh it's just bring in, bring in the twins did we bring both of them yeah we, can we brought we brought the twins we out to california down, with man. us and <laughs> did you go through um, border check the <laughs> i was wondering if you went oh, through we el paso actually... <laughs> through border check yeah, yeah. nobody blinks <laughs> and we got to go to the bay area maker fair and show off our drums and the issue that our tutorial was in was in the print magazine. Yeah, that was just so fun. That was such great. a fun confluence. We had a fun moment with, oh, you weren't there. Uh, I was with Chip, uh, with uh, with security at the Grand, uh, not the Grand Canyon, the Hoover Dam. Oh, wow. So mm. We just did a thing in, uh, I guess, like, I don't know, April? Yep. Yeah, this I year, it was this year. Um, so we went out to Vegas and, and, uh, and we're driving by Hoover Dam and I'm like, I've never been there and we're, and, and we have this sort of kind of stack of shows that we do we have this kind of full stage show and then we have this narrator slash singer character who comes with us um anyway so we were doing that in vegas and uh uh so i'm traveling out with chip this singer uh amazing guy it's amazing artist but anyway we're like neither one of us been to hoover dam we've got time 
We pull in, and of course, it's a full car inspection. Yeah. Oh, like, boy. Oh. <laughs> I just pull open the doors, and that guy just doesn't know what to do. He's like, what is all this? <laughs> so we're in a band, and these are robots. <laughs> I'm, sh- I'm sure the eyebrow went up, you know, like, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, so the other ears come out. Yeah. And, yeah, sniffing anyway. dogs, I'm sure. Oh, man. But they let us through. That's funny. So the robots have been the Hoover Dam. And they've been on an airplane. We got our robots on an oh, airplane. That's right, yeah. Wow. We, when we went last year for the World Maker Fair, we just brought one robot. Uh, and we packed him in, we, we packed him in just a drum case, right? Yeah. And we had a drum case and a suitcase. And we, we, Quentin redesigned the entire the thing rebuild, yeah. so that all of the motors and mechanisms come all the way off the drum and then they just sort of clamp back on. Huh. Whereas normally they're hard because we needed to be able to take it apart and get it on and off an airplane. And so we shipped the batteries to ourselves uh, and we redesigned the bot so they could go on the plane. So the, the, the box had actually flown now. Yeah. And I don't know what they thought at the x-ray station because <laughs> we just checked them. And yep. I cannot imagine the kinds of head scratching. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have to put in there kind of questions that, that uh, they were asking themselves, but it came out the other end. We got them both times. That's Coming pretty cool. That yeah. is. I didn't think think about the security logistics of these, this equipment, but like especially just going through border patrol, they're pretty cool. But my gosh, if you drive to California with a piece of fruit, I guess you're yeah, getting right. numbered. <laughs> yeah, write you down on a list you're on for the rest of your life if you try to bring a banana into California. Mm-hmm. But somehow the cleared without much problem. Yeah. But, the, yeah, they raise eyebrows, and there's always a little explaining to do. But, you know, you can just call the stuff up on the web, and it's like, yeah, this is what we do with them. And, boy, traveling with these things is tricky. Uh, mm-hmm. We have to drive almost everywhere we go because it's just it's impractical to think about getting this gear, the full show, you know, worth of gear onto an airplane. Uh, it's just it's, it's, co- it's ineffective cost-wise. Uh, and we just don't have the the right cases for it. Like, we just, we can't do it. We actually own a giant flight case that everything would fit into, but it weighs like a thousand pounds. Wow. And it would take three or four weeks to get anywhere on a, an 18 wheeler. And that's an interesting thing that, that, you know, we're kind of bumping up against because as, as it sort of starts to happen and starts to take off a little bit, now we're trying to figure out how we get our stuff everywhere. And everything fits into the truck, but just barely. And so if our band grows and we add new machines, we've got to figure out how we're going to get them around. Like, we're maxed out on space. Do we now have to buy a trailer and pull a trailer behind the truck? Do we have to buy a bigger vehicle? Like, we're, we're having some growing pains, which is a great place to be, but, but it gives us a lot to think about. Yeah, well, I can imagine at least with that on your your mind, um, um, you know that uh, that would be a, kind of an easier way of you know con- considering the journey you've been on, uh, you know, or figuring you out only uh, go places you can drive to. And so, now it's I mean, just imagine, uh, uh, do we get the, the vehicle? Okay, uh, if we get this, you know, hey, this will work. Compared to okay, uh, I got this pneumatic. I've got that switch. I've got the uh, pull. The, you know, uh, the journey you've been on. Uh, it seems like that would be oh, that's going to be easy kind of situation. Y'all, have, y'all have done the hard work. That should be easy, right? Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So we're either going to have to redesign the robots so that they take up less space, or think really hard about the next vehicle we buy. Hey, if anybody's listening and you would like to sponsor an amazing robot band by gifting us with a really <laughs> cool vehicle, we, we are open to negotiation. Hey, we're about to hit the top of the hour here pretty soon, and I, I didn't want to assume that we were going to keep you longer, but would you like to stay a little bit longer for the next uh, half hour or so? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, sounds great. Awesome. That's a great- oh. Cool. All right, well, then let's uh, go ahead and take the break uh, a minute or two early. And uh, when we come back, we'll continue our conversations and um, in, we'll just have a good old time here uh, talking to our guests uh, from Pony Trap, uh, Quentin and Hillary Thomas Oliver. So don't go anywhere. Listening to 
Space Boy Universe on the SVU Network. Explore the universe with Space Boy and Sir Lada. Greetings, Space Cadets. Let's see what's in the sky tonight in the Space Boy Universe. Tonight, in the eastern sky, we have Space Boy Universe rising above the horizon in glorious splendor. And in the west, we can see Solanus Majoris, which is visible at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, just below the K-28 belt. So keep your eyes on the sky and listen to Space Boy Universe. Listening to Space Boy Universe. Here are your hosts, Space Boy and Sir Lana. All right, we're back. And, um, you know, um, as many of uh, the Space Cadets know, uh, we uh, are a big supporter of Maker Fair. And, um, you know, I wanted to get uh, both of y'all's take on the Maker Fair community. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, we personally have, have had some great experiences. We've met some really awesome people that you know just as creators but they'll actually like hey give me a call if you need help Mm -hmm. setting up or hauling or making something it's just some of the coolest people i've met in the last 10 years maybe and uh, so tell us a little bit about your experiences with the the maker community uh how did we first end up being uh, getting going to maker fair did we kind of seek them out or did we meet did you meet them at a robot group thing or how did that connection first get me? Was it Cammy that you first met, or was it 
Oh, it's definitely Kit. Andrew? But, or? Uh, it's got to come from the robot robot meetup, the robot group. Right, because the robot group here in Austin goes to the Austin office up there every year, and they do demonstrations of their stuff. So it must have been through the robot group that we first but connected I, with the maker community. Yeah, I don't really know. But, but, I mean, we just love them. Oh, man. They are so supportive and friendly and kind and generous with their knowledge and their resources and... And, you know, it always feels good when someone's into your thing. And uh, and they really love us, and we just love them right back. Uh, I love going to Maker Faire. I love, I love that we've kind of magically fallen completely by accident into this family of people. It kind of came out of nowhere. And I just like seeing all the varieties of create, creativity, like, there's a whole lot of things you can make. <laughs> yeah, you can make fabric crafts and paper crafts mm -hmm. and leather crafts, and metal crafts and Lego crafts and uh, things that fly and things that move on their own and things that make art. Uh, like you can make a make a robot that makes art for you. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. we we love we love that 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 um, that we've been embraced by that community. It's just. It's just been magical. It has. It really has. Yeah, just great people and a great environment, and everywhere we've been, all the maker fairs that we've been to have been really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, the makers of uh, in general have always been out of all the maker uh, events that we've been to, have been just enthusiastic, um, willing to share their information, um, uh, willing to hey, you got an idea? Well, you uh, you're not quite there. It, it kind of like you were discussing earlier, where you know you had an idea and then all of a sudden you came across a person and, and that move the the narrative along for you um you know we've met many people at maker fair that are in that same vibe in that same vein of of wanting to share and create and that i think that's what it all comes down to is the creation to be well, able to create i learned so much like i didn't know here in houston and i guess across the country or the world we have things called maker spaces and a lot of them here are in our public libraries where if you do have an idea for a project, you can actually look for a makerspace near you and go there and talk to people say, hey, I need to 3D print this or I want to build a teeny little robot or I need to do this type of thing. And it, you can go there and they'll just help you get started or I need to lathe something, you know, so. And it, you can do it at a public library here. And I just think that's mind blowing. Yeah, we have those those same spaces here in, in Austin and there's one up in Round Rock that's actually connected to, is it a Home Depot or a Lowe's? Lowe's yeah. And that's like the most cool. brilliant cross mark. If there's literally like a door you can walk through and go right into the Lowe's and buy whatever you need to make your <laughs> right. thing and then go back to the makerspace and the makerspace has every tool imaginable and like libraries of information and you can rent space on, a, on a, like an, an ongoing basis, or you can just go in and pay by the hour to use all their stuff. And of course, everybody who's in the building becomes part of what's available to you as a resource because everybody's happy to share knowledge and information and help you in any way. And yeah, it's, an, it's amazing. It's such an incredible uh, way to help people get started or get finished or just get to the next level with their project. We, we, um, when the makerspace in Round Rock opened up, they had this big party, and we brought the drummers out mm. and demonstrated the drums at their party, and and it was just a blast. It was so cool to see what everybody was doing with the space and mm -hmm. and be a part of that. That was really awesome. Yeah, it is uh, just a wonderful group of people, and you know, I think yeah, you know, it's funny how organic, uh, you know, you, uh, what you're describing, and also what we've experienced. Uh, how things kind of intertwined. I know that uh, when I was back at the Houston Community College working on a uh, my associate's degree, um, I my um, Photoshop teacher, um, I ended up meeting him like uh, several years later at uh, a maker, maker fair, space, yeah. uh, yeah, maker space, and uh, and now the the Houston Community College has built this wonderful engineering department that has is developing a lot in of maker space. In, in maker space and it's really great oh, and, nice. and so i mean and, and they're doing like the 3d printing they're it's even a whole collaborative mm -hmm. environment in there it's set up for 
group collaboration, the whole building. It's really fascinating. But you know, they're 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 That's doing awesome. the 3D making, they're doing shirt making, they uh, yeah, printing. printing and the one uh, one button, what do you call that? Recording? Yeah, I, w- I was going to say they they have video in it, they you know, the video production. They're even about to start doing of all things podcasting. And so, um, at some point, I think uh, everybody wants I might, I might be invited back to help out on that project. And maybe you could find a new co-host. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you'll have to die, dear. <laughs> so anyway, but that uh, didn't sound threatening. So, um, but yeah, it's it's a great community, and <laughs> I'm I'm glad to hear that your experiences have uh, also been the same as ours. And uh, you know, it's just really great. My question is. Are either one of you native Texans or? I am. I'm from Fort Worth. I was born and raised in Fort Worth. Okay. And uh, I've lived in Austin now for 23 years, somewhere around there. I think that's about right, about 23 years. Well, Space and, Boy's uh, from the- Bandera up there where, where, where y'all are. So I was wondering, oh. yeah, because y'all live in Austin, and that has a rich, long history of music, music influence, and live music. What is it like to be musicians living in Austin? Does it influence you, or you just soak it in, is, or, is or is it, is it a just part, a part of it all? Part of the weirdness there. It's just part of the scene, or does it help? Boy, you know, you talk about keeping Austin weird. We are definitely doing our part. Good for uh, you. One of our one of our favorite ways to promote our project is we'll take the camper shell off the back of the truck. And we'll either put um, the twins back there, they're kind of the smaller, louder robots, or sometimes we'll put uh, Dot Man is the name of the, the big guy who's kind of made of drum heads and looks like a person, or we'll put them all in there, and we will run a cord through the window and have the laptop in the passenger seat and have the drums running while we're driving around town. And people go freaking nuts. We've had people follow us. We've had people film us with their cell phones and put it on Reddit. We, we ended up in a viral video of somebody filming us in the back of a truck. Uh, and, uh, and, and and it's just a fun, a fun way to connect with people. I'm like, it's like a joy machine. People start <laughs> smiling. They kind of can't believe what they're seeing and everybody makes everybody so happy. And, and we'll hand out stickers and, and, uh, and just kind of bring a little bit of weird into people's lives. It's a really good fit. Uh, Pony Trap with our robot drummers playing music here in Austin. Uh, word word gets out that uh, that something like this is going on, and people get really interested in checking it out. We also like to bring the robots down to South by Southwest and just parade up and down the street with them. That's one of the beautiful things about them being fully mobile. We can take them anywhere. We we don't have to. Uh, we don't have to have a stage in order to have a show. All we need is an open open space and so we'll we'll put the we have a little garden cart like a heavy duty garden cart and we'll strap the drums onto it and just pull them up and down the street and fire them off and and people go bananas and they're battery and powered really, right really, they're all battery powered yeah. That's right, yeah and we've got a whole fleet of uh of rechargeable uh <laughs> batteries so we can you know the, the drums start getting a little sleepy and we swap out the batteries and and uh refire them and it's just a blast it's so fun that's yeah, we're pulling, that. uh, we, when we do that we're, we're pulling around 200 pounds of batteries yeah i think yeah oh, wow. yep it's a full strength <laughs> <laughs> that should be murder but, on the old gas mileage so are these regular car batteries or are they <laughs> marine batteries or what you know are they what kind of batteries we use uh, we use the recharger packs. Um, so like the kind of the the thing you might throw in the trunk just to uh, get your car going if it doesn't start one day. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what we're using. Mm-hmm. They're uh, they're steel lead acid batteries. Um, probably about uh, half the storage capacity of the actual you know drop in your car battery. Um, I like I like to use those for a couple reasons. One is that they're sealed. Um, so you can't spill it, you know, you'd have mm-hmm. to, you'd have to really mess up to, to make a mess out of it. Um, and they, and they come with the clamps on them. So I just recharge them, throw them on. I actually use those clamps to, to connect it to the robot. And it's, it's just a really clean kind of easy, easy system. And they're super heavy, but they have built in handles. <laughs> <laughs> She's talking about, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask the obvious question because Hillary and I were talking about, you know, song titles and fake band names. So why the name Pony Trap? Oh, that's a funny thing. Um, so, well, it came from a, a conversation uh, with a, a former person, a uh, former person member of the band. Um, <laughs> Still a person, as, as, we know. as far as I know. He turned him into a robot, and now he regrets it. Now. <laughs> I replaced him with a robot. Um, so I, <laughs> there's this great sort of uh, uh, apocryphal story about this kid who spends you know most of his life telling everybody that he wants a pony. And everybody's like, oh, God, you know, the kid in town who wants a pony, and all he ever talks about is how he wants a pony. Um, and eventually – you know, whatever the machinations of the story and it, it gets told different ways, but he gets a pony and it's because he was putting it out there the whole time. And, and, you know, the other side of that is that I want a pony is this kind of classic kid metaphor for mm -hmm. the great one, right? You know, we all want a pony. So I just thought that we would trap them <laughs> rather than wait for, the, wait for the ponies to show up that we would just go grab it. So the, the band is sort of, so the pony and the metaphor is a life as an artist without compromise. And the track is, uh, we're just going to make, make this enticing uh, atmosphere where that dream will come to us. And, um, and, and that's why we make music. Uh, we are we're driven to make this music by some spark of inspiration. And and all we really want is to make that music without having to without having to answer to anybody for it. Mm -hmm. And um, if, we, if if we can do that, whether we're making a living at it or not, we we we've, we've successfully trapped the pony. Of course, we love getting paid, uh, and we we want to do this and not, <laughs> not have to do anything else. You know, like maybe that's the real pony is is getting to do this for a living. Right. Uh, but yeah, we're we're just out there trying to trying to entice ponies into our trap. It's totally innocent. <laughs> I'm so glad I asked that question. We're <laughs> a, a big, live big, trap. big pony yeah. fans. Yeah. The, the ponies will be very well treated. It's friendly. Yes, yeah. it's soft. It's comfortable. Yeah. One of my favorite um, sort of side effects of the name is that it's. Uh, uh, there's a there's a thing of Cockney rhyming slang. Yes. So the final. Oh yes. Thing, yeah. Right. So uh, I have first learned of this uh, from Ocean's Eleven, where he says, you know, we're in Barney, and they're like, what? It's like Barney Rubble, Trouble. Mm -hmm. So Pony Trap, Cockney rhyming slang for crap. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which I, I just think it's hilarious, and we had just a dumb funny moment with that when we were following the Tour de France. Um, uh, there are these two, if, if you're into bike racing, uh, and no one is, but if you were into bike racing, uh, all of the people in the world that are into bike racing are on the phone right now. There are these, uh, there are these two announcers that do all the big races and they're, you know, they're famous and they're sort of well-known voices of the, of the sport and they're Phil and Paul. And so we're walking through some little town in France after the race and we see Phil and Paul who have clearly just finished announcing the race and they're walking downtown for dinner. And, and we basically I just a, a lost it. Yeah, I lost we, my mind. We run up to them and insist that we take our photo that we they take their photo our photos with them and uh and uh and they're just these super charming fellows who are happy to meet fans and and uh and, and they're just the sweetest dude. And I have a viola that I've been having people sign, having bike racers sign. So I hand them the viola and it of course has a pony trap sticker on it. It's like he's a laugh, he's like you know what that means, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then they realized that we start our band after poop. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. I, I know what you mean by the Cockney rhyming slang, or rather, so you might be familiar with Cockney music, which is, you know, the da 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 There is yeah. a English comedian called, he calls himself Bill Bailey. It's not his real name, but he is a musician comedian, and he is crazy talented and funny. You can find his stuff on YouTube, but it's getting harder and harder to find now because the specific clip is gone where he has his keyboard and he performs. He talks about, I'm going to show you how there is Cockney music and classical music. And he performs these little, 
you know, classical pieces, and he shows uh-huh. you where it is. And then that's how I got Space Boy hooked on Bill Bailey. And he got his start in a British sitcom called Black Books, which is an Irish sitcom, really. And there's this great um, episode of Black Books where his character, Manny, sits down in front of a piano and just starts playing. He didn't know he could play. And all of a sudden he's playing along the radio and he's going, ah, oh my God, I can play. And his two friends blackmail him and says, I need you to impress my girlfriend. And I need you to impress my piano teacher. And they quote unquote, stuff him in the grand piano. And he's in there banging on the strings with spoons to make it sound like they're concert pants. <laughs> I just, you've got to check that out. You, That's easy to find uh, on black books where he's in there. I forget the name of the episode, but Bill Bailey, he's a he did a cover of Cars by Gary Newman. He sung it in French with a, a studio band, and then when he got to the part that goes dun 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 dun, dun he played it on bicycle horns. Now that is on YouTube. Oh, uh, that's brilliant. Awesome. I knew I you'd love totally that. So go go check him out. Just Bill Bailey. He's like as in Won't You Come Home, Bill Bailey. That's why he stole that as his stage name. So. Oh, yep. Okay. That's great. You'd love it if you could find any of his concerts. Go check out. You two would love them. I love how he did the uh, version of the BBC theme music. Oh, and you know the BBC the, has their 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 news. They have a, apparently they have a cool kind of a techno y apocalyptic theme. rave. So he turned it into an apocalyptic <laughs> rave, and he, he was performing it live on the keyboard. And he had his theremin. He was doing the sci-fi noises, and he's going, "This is the BBC." And it was like everybody was jumping, and so everybody has covered that, by the way. Everybody since then has gone and made their own BBC News apocalyptic rave covers. So Okay, so, so, so uh, you know, um, as musicians... Um, uh, you three as musicians. Uh, um, has there been an opportunity to meet any of your idols? <laughs> I know where this is going. Absolutely, yeah. We, I don't know, maybe three or four weeks ago... One of Quentin's favorite bands was in town playing a show. Um, and a friend of ours, she's just sort of a magic rock star magnet. Yeah. <laughs> she's no fun. Yeah. She used to date a rock star. Yeah. She met a bunch of rock stars. Yeah. But anyway. So she's hanging out with these guys, and she's specifically hanging out with the drummer, and she's telling him about our project. And then you get this text from her and it's like hey are you at home yeah we're at home how about if i bring the drummer from ministry over or from uh Prong. from pong over yeah. to your house and you can show him the drums and you basically have a, a, a seizure yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you're telling me about it and i'm at work and i basically abandon my desk and get in the car to come home hope my boss is losing right now and uh and i'm like yes okay i'll be there and we'll make this happen and so the drummer from Fron comes over and you've got dot man the whole rig yeah, and I both of the twin out, yeah. and just like everything set up and and i i had just got peaches at the from our neighbor and i'm giving him peaches and and you're setting up the drums and and this you know this was one of my favorite Mo- like that sweet moment I was telling you about earlier where you, you watch the people in the room and their reactions when mm-hmm. you fire off the drums. This guy is like an incredible, incredible drummer. And you hit go, you hit play, and he basically jumps three feet out of his seat and he's plastered to the wall in, in shock and surprise. And I was so satisfied. <laughs> I was like, yes! Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and it's just this thunderous, amazing sound filling the room and so we got to we got to show off our robot drummers for the drummer for one of your favorite industrial music bands who's, who's a huge influence on your music yeah and that was very very cool that is wow, yeah. that's awesome you know i i've always wondered uh you know is it uh, going to be one of those situations where you finally meet your idols and and then you finally meet them and you're utterly no, disappointed? Never but meet your idols. Th- yeah, they say you'd never meet your idols, but in, at least in this situation, it sounds like uh, you had an overwhelming experience. You probably blew him away instead of the other way around. Oh, oh yeah, we had a great time, and he was actually, he was also just charming and funny, and yeah. and we had a great afternoon, and uh, yeah, that was awesome. It was super fun. Space Boy met his musical idols, you know, as a as a part of a paid quick meet and greet 
right there in Austin, I believe, where they perform Austin City Limits about three or four years ago. Oh, who was that? Uh, the Pet Shop Boys. Um, I, I've, oh, hi. I, you know, I'm, oh. my music is very entrenched in electronic music and um, in fact, I get the the name Space Boy from when they collaborated with um, Bowie. David Bowie, and so uh, you know I took that on as my persona. And uh, but yeah, it was you know I've I'd seen them many times in concert uh, as a fan, and then when the opportunity came up to actually do the meet and greet, um, it was very surreal. Um, and I love it because it's um, the fact is that. Uh, um, you know, Serlana was with me, and you know these are these are his like idols uh, in music, far as electronic music inspiration. Goes. I mean, if if if, if it wasn't them, I'd, I would have loved to have met uh, Erasure. Erasure. Yeah. Um, but as far as you Blessing. know, you know, from the day one since I you know heard their music, it was like this is this is my my style. This is what I love to listen to. But I mean, I'm capable of doing other music. It's just, this is, this is it. This is That's the, close to your heart. Yeah. So, uh, we walk in and, um, you, you remember how, uh, um, it's just a meet where you walk in, they sign your little badge. You, you say hi, you shake their hands and then they, you know, they heard you on, but go ahead and tell the, well, yeah. you see, these are his idols. So naturally you're going to be a little, maybe a little hesitant tongue tied. <laughs> I love them too. I love their music, but they don't have that entrenched meaning for me. I'm not a musician. I'm just a listener. So he was like, um, uh, and I was like, oh, hey, Chris. Hey, Neil. And, <laughs> like, like we've known them all for, you know. And, and when she did that, it kind of like, it just dis- kind of way it disarmed me. And it was like, I looked at her and I'm like, they're you know, just people. It was just a really kind of a surreal moment, and I thought that was cool that she just like, oh, hey, you know. And then they asked me how I was doing, and I, I, not even thinking, I said absolutely fabulous, which is one of their songs. One of their big dance and, numbers. And and, <laughs> and, and and Neil laughed at that, and it's like, uh, it was like, oh, oh cool, cool. So it's like the eight millionth time you've heard it. <laughs> and he's, they signed. They were very polite, and you know, uh, a very nice English gentleman. And Chris uh, actually spoke because Chris is known for not talking. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, it was a moment that I will always remember, not necessarily just for meeting my idols, but the reaction of watching uh, my wife, Solana, <laughs> just being so casual, like, oh, this is happens every day, you know. <laughs> um, and so, you know, but the, yeah, that, so I don't regret meeting meeting them and... Uh, you didn't uh, see him long enough to be disappointed. Yeah, so it was just enough long enough, uh, you know, to, okay, let's move along. And, you know, and, uh, well, you know, and it was a great concert. Oh, my God. They yeah. put on a show. Laser. You. I mean, it was lasers, lasers and everything. And uh, uh, um, the, dancers. the last song of the evening was like just so hardcore and the the rhythm and the beat and the where bass. disco balls on their head and it's being projected the lights been coming off of their their hats and their heads and it's just awesome. they've <laughs> always been they've always been great for a performance and um you know so every concert i've been to it's been just phenomenal but this last one that we saw it was just it was a magical evening to say the least so uh, i love the fact that i finally got to meet them and shake their hands and uh, you know that first, experience will first time in austin yeah. for me so, but anyway, that, yeah, that was my, that's me meeting my idols and, uh, you know, and, um, so that leads me into what was your first concert you went to? Do you remember? Do you remember? What was your first concert, babe? Uh, I, there's a couple answers to that. <laughs> so the very first concert I ever went to that was just me going to a live show was the, uh, the Hagger Twins from Hee Haw. <laughs> they came to our nice. They played that was the high school gym. It was the junior high gym. <laughs> the Hagger awesome. Twins played the uh, junior high gym in Greencastle, Indiana. Uh, the Stare first cool. concert I like asked to go to that I made a point out of going to was Molly Hatchet. <laughs> oh wow! In 1980. Uh, yeah, flirting with disaster. They just changed singers, so that was kind of a bummer. Uh, and then you know the the first concert i went to that really like meant something and changed my life it was like a little basement punk rock show uh and that's going to be de Kreutzen. so those are my that's my long what's your first concert what's yours babe the first my mom of course is a singer and is super into music so we went to a bunch of musicals growing up but the first concert that i went to she took us to see billy no wait what's his name 
I almost said Billy Idol, but it's not Billy Idol. No, no it's Billy, uh, Joel. Billy Joel. That's the guy. Oh, that's a diverse <laughs> spectrum there. Oh, she just like, had a Space Boy moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of a million miles between Billy Idol and Billy Joel. Uh, and I would have been happy to see either of them, frankly. But Billy Joel was incredible. He was, we were little. I was mm. probably 10, 12 years old. Mm-hmm. And he played for two and a half hours without a break. And he played all the songs you hear on the radio. It was mm-hmm. so super fun. Um, and probably the first show I ever went to just of my own accord was probably some local band. I went to see tons and tons of local music when I was in high school in Fort Worth and was at the at the same clubs every weekend. Uh, there were two big clubs that I loved to go to. They were basically next door to each other. They were the Hop and they were Mad Hatters. And uh, I loved going to see local music. And all my friends were convinced that I was going to be a local music critic when I, when I grew up because I loved to write and talk about music and listen to music. And uh, I couldn't tell you what the band was. No idea. But, um, but uh, I went out all the time to see live music growing up. And well, you, were in, you were in a perfect was, area for Dallas-Fort Worth because I I, I'm not from Texas. I In a small town, Louisiana, we just didn't have access to really big you know names like that we didn't we'd have to drive over to dallas from shreveport so well my first wow. band that i went to go see was back in the 70s was the Bee Gees. um i was nice. i was a youngster and um you nice. know and so that was my first band uh the first band that uh, uh that elevated my consciousness to <laughs> a new level was deep purple um it was in san antonio and uh, my uh, my parents brought me along with their friends and of course um, her best friend went ahead they didn't have tickets for all on the floor so we sat up and uh you know her friend and 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 myself sat on the uh, kind of like the nose bleeding section which was probably maybe not the best seat to sit for a kid because uh smoke started to rise up and uh, the the con- the contact high was was pretty incredible but all I remember is that was a good concert. You uh, sure didn't dream it for for a, for a fourteen year old kid. Yeah, I had a good time at that concert. You were fourteen. I was yeah, I was like, four. I was like, wow, that was just deep purple, you know. I had the similar experience <laughs> to quitting. My first concert, I didn't even want to go to it. I don't even know how I got there. I didn't want to be there, and it was the Judds. And I was like, oh, why uh, am I even here? Because I'm not, I'm, I was, I've never been into country music. I'm still not sorry. I just, it doesn't well, do I, anything for I, me. I think the conversation I've had with Solana is that uh, I'm kind of old country, you know, uh, the uh, West Texas sound, the uh, Apache mm-hmm. Klein, the, you know, back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s uh, There's country music. a time and place for that. I just haven't found the time or the place yet. <laughs> so. <laughs> But when I do, I'll let you all know about it. <laughs> There's a great quote about country music that all the good stuff happened between the sevens and the 67 to 77. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Modern That's country is awful. Stuff. It is just awful. Yeah. Ugh. Well, you know, a lot I of can't find I was going to this is a good point to talk about that is that uh, um modern music and, and you know, it's it's not um, it's 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 kind of like just packaged for consumption. True, but we are living in a great time for music because there there's genres happening new every day. Mm-hmm. Whether you what do you think like like in the last year I've discovered vaporwave. I didn't even know that was a thing until I started watching something on YouTube. I guess I'm referring to mainstream music. Oh, you're talking yeah, about yeah. To, who listens to the radio? Uh, I mean, uh, that's for uh, you know weirdos. It's just it's it's kind of sad because uh, you know I think I was reading an article about the. Uh, how um you know modern music is just not that good it's i mean like and when i say TV. that i'm not referring to the indie artist because that's some great stuff um you know you find a lot of great stuff out You're there talking about like rihanna lady gaga you know Katy Bieber. perry yeah J- uh, justin beaver yeah, you do and, like some of that stuff I, I, some of it's okay i've heard but, him listen but, to Katy perry uh, um tyler swift um you know i some when you burn it down like in a crucible there's some of it's good but it's not like i'm like going out there to listen to i am not going to reveal my spotify playlist just so you know those (laughs) i will not not be sharing them 
I think you're really onto something. I think I think this is both a horrible time for music and a wonderful time for music. I think that that the the beauty of the technology we have now is that anyone can everyone mm-hmm. can put their music out there, so you can hear everything you want to hear, and that's amazing. You can write it, you can produce it, you can record it, you can share it all from the comfort of your bedroom, and that is incredible. It's but, yeah. total total democracy of the creative process yeah. and that is awesome but I also agree that that at, on the top level like music has been turned into its product mm. uh, so so when you start thinking of music as content instead of art then what you get at that at that level is kind of awful yeah um, and it it's really like that sort of top level music right now is is not good mm. in general mm-hmm. Um so yeah, it's it's kind of it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. There's a lot of really amazing stuff like, you know, we couldn't be doing what we're doing and sort of inching our way toward actually just doing this um, without you know what Hillary's talking about, this you know, the democratization of music. Like we couldn't we couldn't have a public face with what we're doing twenty mm-hmm. years ago. Yeah. So that's really cool. Um, and there's, you know, just tons and tons and tons of stuff that you can access. You know, even if you're just a kid from the 80s that wants to hear old punk rock bands, like, I, the other day, really wanted to hear a Rebels and Infidel song, and, you know, I don't have that record anymore, and then, yet there it was, you know, mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. Tales of Terror, it's totally there, you can find <laughs> this stuff online. Um, so that's really amazing, so... That's what I like about yeah. it too. There's, I mean, even if you think it's gone, you can do a search. So it's somewhere. So that's what I like about it. Right. And I gotta say, like, I this it's a guilty pleasure. The the modern pop music, like the top top mm-hmm. twenty, you know, re, like the worst examples of modern music, modern pop music. That that is my guilty pleasure these days because sometimes. I can't listen to NPR. I just can't <laughs> listen to the band. I can't think about the world around me. I, High five. I get so upset, so wound up. I get so worried and anxious and angry when I think about the world. It is a beautiful escape from everything meaningful mm-hmm. to listen to pop music. You got to drive home and listen to back that thing up. And, and see, that's kind of like how yeah. Sirlana and I Break felt it. about uh, like 80s music and new wave. And then all of a sudden... Um, the disc jockey killed the pop star of the the you know um, well, of the eighties because you go from that that vibrant fun kind of stuff. They and killed then, the new wave, and then we go into grunge, and, and then it, they killed hair bands. And, and it's nothing against you know the the, the grunge stuff or you know even you know because. Uh, there's some good stuff out of that, but it's just the way they killed. It's not worth it, it yeah, for just what like, we lost. Why do I have to dress like a lumberjack now? I just didn't understand that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's, but Eric, aren't you glad there's something for everyone? Yes. It, now it's, there's, it's something for everyone, and er, it, it, even Grammel can bug but out. But people get too. very violent about liking one thing and judgy about oh you like that kind of music so i'm like you like it that's great don't force me to listen to it that's but all yeah I at the end of the day i there's only so much baby 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 i can take i you love know? the piano cover of that though <laughs> i freaking love covers i listen to once again i want to say that we love our canadian brothers to the north and you know uh, we would be happy if you took them back you know so <laughs> yeah he ain't, he ain't in the news anymore but i listen to and i put it on my facebook wall a modern cover it was this or symphony orchestral accompaniment of a flock of seagulls it was the actual band they were in a studio playing um what is that song i can't remember the name uh, of it see, you I saw just, your eyes and it made uh, me uh, smile it, space age love space song. age love song god where he was singing that and the orchestra was accompanying him and i was like oh that is so freaking awesome because they still had the guitars from the original band mm-hmm. and but they had that in-studio orchestra accompanying it and i just thought that was great so i still love variety with my classical I, I'm, I, I'm at it and it's funny you bring that up too because we're kind of talking about this is what i found interesting about watching that video is that um, i'm saying to myself 
Man, I'm getting Times have I, I'm getting old because these Mike score has no hair. <laughs> yes, he has no hair. <laughs> no hair. Uh, those good old days of, you know, the, the, the floppy flop, do. yeah. Cuz he was a, a hairstylist. That was his um mm-hmm. profession when they made um Iran. Mm-hmm. That video. So that's why they all had crazy hair. So. And that hair just became famous. Right, totally. It's as famous as much for the hair. Man, everybody mm-hmm. had that hair. It was really embarrassing for a while there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that album, by the way, was good end to end. Oh, God, oh, yeah. I love that. I love that. I, I like that whole album. There's, there's something about Space Age Love Song that's like, okay, drop the disco ball. Mm-hmm. It's it's feel good time. You know? Well, uh, uh, another one of mine is Wishing. I like that one. Wishing too. I had a photograph of you. That's yeah. good. It's a little more laid back. It, it's a kind of a, yeah. I'm, I'm hearing it in my head now. <laughs> Solana's over there bopping her head, too. Yeah. Uh, you can't see that on the radio. <laughs> no. You'll have to take my word for it. Well, hey, guys. Um, so this is the point where, you know, why don't we plug uh, your social and your, your medias and websites, and, yeah. and and that way you get new fans and, and our space cadets can get connected to you. Well, we're all over the place. Um, you can look us up on Facebook. We're just Pony Trap, all one word. Uh, and then we're on Twitter as Pony Trap Music. Twitter and Instagram and our website are all Pony Trap Music. And you can find us on YouTube also as just Pony Trap. And that's it. Oh, well. Wow. That's all we got. Uh, 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 cue this, uh, the, 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 the robot. Yeah. <laughs> the the rim shot. The rim shot. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. There you go. I, maybe I should have gotten some coffee instead of drinking water tonight. But anyway, uh, guys, we uh, we we love the fact you you spent some time with us exploring uh, Pony Trap, and I think that between Solana and myself, we're really jazzed. Pardon the uh, music uh, joke. There. Sorry about that. And um, <laughs> you know uh, about uh, meeting y'all in October at Maker Fair here in Houston. We're really excited to come down to Houston and play. It sounds like the Houston Maker Fair is awesome, so we can't wait to see it and yeah. to meet you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we must we must meet each other and compare notes and you won't be able to get rid of us. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah, no. trust me. Yeah, we'll we'll have our cameras and be talking in the corner. I'm like, can you get rid of those Space Boy people, please? <laughs> well, guys, uh, yeah, we can't. go ahead. But we just we can't wait. We can't wait to really can't wait for Houston Maker Fair. We've been hearing so many good things about it. We understand it's huge and they bring in all kinds of cool stuff and we just we're super yeah we're really excited we're gonna we're gonna work as hard as we can to get this big new robot ready to premiere there too because that's that's our that's our big goal and uh and holy cats have we enjoyed talking to you guys (laughs) just been wicked fun well you know uh, you know not to toot our horn but uh anybody to everybody that comes on always has like hey uh this has been fun they're like i can only give you 20 minutes three uh, hours uh, later they don't know what happened exactly that's that's our fun part (laughs) Uh, so you know you're in good company when it comes to people that come on this universe you know we don't do gotcha questions it's all about having a good time and learning about uh uh, what you're providing and uh our space cadets as we call our our listeners uh always have a good time and chat and have a lot of feedback and so you you know, a lot of positive feedback in our, our chat tonight about Pony Trap tonight. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Really glad to hear that. Mm-hmm. Thanks to everybody who's listening. And look us up. We'd love to love to connect with, with anyone who wants to know more about why we're doing what we're doing and what the heck it is we're doing after all. Yeah, and, and I want to also wrap up just by saying thanks. You yeah. know, thank you to you guys and thank you to the listeners. It's been really fun. Well, cool. Well, awesome. hope, hopefully we can have you back in the future and, uh, you know, keep our uh, information and uh, we'll keep tabs on you and uh, we'll, you know, I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Yeah, and I will be seeing you. I hope so. Yes, yeah, I can't wait for October. Awesome. All right, good night, guys, and uh, uh, thanks for being a part of the universe tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank we'll you. Talk to you soon. All right. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. All right, another exciting evening. Oh, do we have a call there? No, I'm like, is now, Dino? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I tell you what, Dino, wait. Let's take our break, and uh, uh, let's see. Here. Yeah, let's take the break, and we'll be right back.
You are listening to Space Boy Universe on the SVU Network. Explore the universe with Space Boy and Sir Lada. Get your game on on Space Boy Universe. Level up with Space Boy Universe. No quarters, no problems. Play it at Space Boy Universe. been sounding great. You are listening to Space Boy Universe. Here are your hosts, Space Boy and Sir Lana. All right. If you probably heard my accidental uh, unmuting of the button, you probably know our next uh, caller on the air, and that is Dino. How are you, my friend? Well, hello. How are you, Sir Lana and Space Boy? Nice to talk to you. You're sounding great. 
I really only had one thing to say tonight, which is unusual, which is uh, the group uh, Pony Trap. I was hoping I would have been able to talk to them live because it reminds me of back in the 80s and 90s, especially in uh, San Francisco before it really got built up. There was the South of Market area where there were a lot of uh, former industrial warehouses, some two-story, three-story, even four-story buildings where in the late 70s, early 80s, groups of people got together and rented the buildings and made artist lofts in them so that at that time you could be a starving artist and live, you know, fairly comfortably. You know, they set up showers and and then as a result, some people were on, you know, SSI, you know, disability or, you know, one thing or another, but they still, having a cheap place to live that was industrial, they could work on a just a plethora of art projects and things. And uh, Pony Trap reminded me that they may be kind of a, uh, you know, a son and daughter of that movement because I remember, I guess it's called steampunk stuff now. The first yeah. kind of stuff I saw of that was a collective of artists, and what were they called? But they would they would put on these shows in the early 90s, late 80s where they would have all kinds of machines that they had welded together and they would blow fire and it was even before robots, you know, and they sometimes they would attack each other. And, oh, and it was bots. just a very yeah. creative... I don't know if he's talking about uh, that or if he's talking about Burning Man. He ta- no, he's talking about battle bots uh, where they would... Uh, well, before that. <laughs> he's about an older <laughs> older time. Not. Yeah, not- it was very mechanical, very mechanical, and they would... Uh, Weld and uh, and they would blow fire and they had these they were they what? would put on performances like for truck people. truckosaurus <laughs> no no they'd actually similar to what y- your guests were doing tonight uh-huh. they would build I wouldn't call it a robot but they would build mechanical contraptions mm-hmm. that weren't as big as a truck but weren't as small as a robot and they would usually stage it outside in a parking lot or uh, some of these industrial places had their yards where they could be blowing fire or squirting things at each other. They were, I don't know, I guess controlled by a, a cord to them by someone on the side. But the point is is that the artists could be very creative and do things. Now, as I say, the, your guest then added a musical component to it, which I see as a, a logical lineage from those days when all types of artists would live in San Francisco. Now, so many of them have been starved out. Um, and you find these type of artists that are kind of industrial, and whether they're doing ceramic or steel or wood sculpture. Um, I, it seems to me across America, any place near a large body of water or maybe near a desert right, where these types of artist collectives and artists can hang, I don't know where now that is going on, but I'm so happy to hear that uh, Pony Trap is able to do something merging music with uh, uh, built built creativity of you know physical sculpture. Really, mm-hmm. is what it is. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was going to talk to them about. But anyhow, hopefully they'll they'll understand. Well, hopefully we'll have them back next time, Dino, and you know we can uh, you know take open up the phone lines with them. Uh, we're having such a good time with them, and they're they're great. Maybe uh, they'll to talk let us to. let us interview them like a week or two before they come here, like mm. like a twenty minute thing or something. Yeah, <laughs> but so, you have to well, be on time, like, Dino. Well, you sounded <laughs> well. I have things to do. It's summer, and I have to do repairs around yeah, the old yeah, house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excuses, excuses. <laughs> You're not really. Offended. Well, maybe I'll have more time. I'm retired now, so we shall see. Uh, but uh, I'll let Bev come on because that's all I had to say tonight. And as always, I'm grateful for. Uh, I should have gone to the county fair, but here I am. I, I have you guys to listen to. Uh-huh. <laughs> since, we don't cost Apparently, as much. I don't have a girlfriend anymore. So <laughs> we'll never uh, break up with you. Since. Yeah, we, we'll we'll always stay true yes. to you. You'll be there. Thank you very much. <laughs> have a good night. <laughs> Bye, Dino. Bye, Dino. <laughs> and let's get our resident marriage counselor on the line, Bev. <laughs> Hi. Howdy, hey. Bev. How are you handling the heat? Oh, God. 
I think when our, you start I, sweating in your own house, I think our AC, bad. yeah, it, it, when when Space Boy's pants blow off and just to try to stay cool, then you know it's hot. Uh, so you know, um, <laughs> um, probably the less said about that, the better. Central, see, we, <laughs> we've had our central air on for about four days now, and we don't like running it. <laughs> but then you should go. You so should humid. go catch it, Bev. You what? Uh, you said you don't like running it, then you should uh, go catch it. Yeah, just don't even engage him. Just <laughs> ignore him. <laughs> well, we like having the house open and having fresh air because it's closed up all winter. Oh. But when it's so humid like it is, <coughs> I can't breathe. We can't do so. that. It's too hot. It's too humid. And we have these giant things called mosquitoes, Texas-sized mosquitoes. We... um. Watched. I watched Justice League today on Amazon, and one of the villains had these flying guys with these, um, like, insect wings that are flying with. I said, look, Texas mosquitoes are attacking the people. <laughs> I said, that's actual size. Oh, my God. Probably, probably like uh, uh, the, uh, what they call palmetto bugs in uh, Ugh, Florida. Which I are know. Cockroaches. We, well, Those we have, things are huge. We have water bugs and they fly oh. and you know. We have lots of uh, we got uh, walking sticks. We've got uh, spiders. We got snakes. Uh, oh my god. Coral snakes. We have we had a deadly snake just rolling across the front of our. But you know we're no Australia. It's uh, they've got some pretty dangerous animals down there. I mean you know. Yeah. That and, snake was like, look, I'm just passing through. I don't want any trouble. And we're like, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, and then you go down in Australia, you know, you say the wrong thing to a koala, and, you know, it's all over you, and the game over, man. Those kangaroos, those male kangaroos yeah. are vicious. Oh, man. Where they're, they, they're roided up, too. Was, they're, like, was, working out, taking like, steroids. They, and, I'd like to know where they go to work out, because, you know, some of those kangaroos muscular. are like, what the? <laughs> they did not skip leg day. <laughs> Oh my gosh! But and it well, it runs up our electric bill too. But oh, I can't. I I can't breathe. I haven't been out of the house in four days. I haven't been out of the house in <laughs> one it, day. I can't breathe when I when it's humid out. Some pop told me he goes, "You're not going anywhere this weekend." Mm. <laughs> I had a headache so bad Thursday, I had to come home from work. It felt like needles were being stabbed through my eyeballs. And it went on all Thursday into Friday. Got even worse. Made me sick at my stomach. Um, Friday, had to, I stayed home for that day, too. And it just it just wouldn't let up. And it's still not that good. I think I might have some kind of side infection or something. But I just... Probably. I don't know. Oh my my baby sister she uh she's got COPD too but she only has to use her oxygen at night when she sleeps but she works in a factory and when it's really hot like this with her you know condition she can't breathe neither so she has a uh, FMLAs that she can take during the summer when it's really hot which is a good thing. Is there but, a point to everything being hot and sweaty? I just don't get it. I mean, what I does it do for the environment that we need so bad to be this uncomfortable? I mean, from body odor. <laughs> I mean, is there some kind of special plant or life form that gives us I don't know. something better in the summer? I mean, I ain't seeing it. I, 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 I don't know. But I don't I, go I out. I... I don't go out e even when it's cold out in the fall on the three days that it's cold um i just don't see any point in being outside there's nothing going on out there that i need to be out exactly. there for <laughs> bob says it's, it's called summer laugh out loud <laughs> <laughs> well you know summer can back. cram it that's what i have to say about it but i like it better than the winter well, y'all have oh. a winter up there. That's the difference. You're, you're in Ohio, and you actually have cold weather. We don't experience yeah. much of that at all. What you're going through with the no, heat and the humidity, that is pretty much 
three hundred days plus a year. So we don't know from cold. Yeah. But see, I'd I'd, I'd rather have the heat than the cold. <laughs> it, oh, it plays excuse the expression hell on our bodies. Hmm. We both have you know arthritis real bad. Oh man. Uh, yeah, you know, I've you know since I've been having the issues with my back, uh, I totally understand the cold thing. I'm getting talk- arthritis oh, yeah. in my right hand, just my right hand, and some days I'm fine, and some days it gets I feel it start getting stiff, and then it just it's so painful. The only thing I can make is a claw, and I'm like, I'm only Aww. I'm only 46. I mean, geez, you know. <laughs> now do your hands go numb? No. Mm-mm. Oh, okay. See, mine, I had a carpal tunnel in both my wrists. See, I kind of wonder if that that's too. part of it, but I can't because my right hand is my mouse hand. Uh, I think why she's having the problems is she constantly beats me, and uh, that's why her hand's starting oh. to hurt. And, uh, and Well, you're not conscious during any of that, well, so yeah, you got to complain about Because it. you knocked me out, and, you know, and... Uh, oh, man, you have been making some noises lately at night, like what? hooting Uh-oh. and... Gaffles Why do you and, wait until now to tell me these things? Uh, I mean, but you do it so fast. It's not like I could whip out my phone and record you. You're just like, <laughs> and then uh, you're, you're done for like 30 minutes. <laughs> and then post it on Facebook, Space Boy, while he's sleeping. <laughs> he probably wouldn't care as long as it's not, you know, incriminating. But, yeah. And he'll like, <laughs> well, and then he's, you're done for, like, wait, it's like, you're just. This, wait, I did that noise? You do stuff like. I mean, I know I do stuff. Because I can tell you're dreaming about something because you're reacting to something. Mm. I don't know what well, it is. Does he snore a lot? He can't. He had that surgery to. He's, yeah, it it's impossible for him to snore. I'm the one asking to snore. Fix. But, um, but I, I stay I, up I later than that. Yeah. But, I, but I moan in my sleep. I mean, he I, moans, he groans, he laughs, he giggles, he makes crazy really? noises, he makes popping noises, <laughs> he does sound effects. Um, <laughs> yes. You ever uh, wonder what he's about? He's the Michael Winslow of unconscious guys. <laughs> Bob says he's doing Bigfoot whoops while he sleeps. <laughs> is, uh, yeah. oh, it, I'll tell you. Bob, I'll tell you what. Maybe so, Kay. I can tell when he's having vivid dreams. <sighs> That's he what I think he's doing. He me out of bed. Well, I don't. Well, he gets restless. He rolls back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know, like Does he's he? on his back, on his side, on his back, on his side, just constantly rolling uh, around. I don't know if you me, know I you're doing that. Position and that's it. Well, I just, I guess it's more so now that uh, you know, I've been having my back problems and you know, trying to get comfortable. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was gonna say it's probably hard for you to get comfortable. At least you don't have a See, cat have sleep sleeping on your bladder. I have to sleep in a a recliner because my back is so bad. And plus, it's hard for me to uh, uh, sleep laying flat because it's hard for me to breathe. Even though I have my CPAP machine and my oxygen hooked to my CPAP machine. (laughs) Yeah, well. It's that time? Yeah, it's that time, Sir Lana. Well, Bev. Uh, you know, oh. I, I'm sorry it was short, uh, but you know, there's always next, okay. there's always next week. We didn't make any breakthroughs, but we're still hoping. Yeah, you know, it, it, you know what they say about therapy? Therapy, it's one, baby steps. Yeah, it's a process. Yeah, it's a process. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Y'all take your baby steps, and everything will be okay. All right. We, I, I heard that as baby stabs. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night. Say, uh, I guess Robert can hear good us night. on the end. So good night, and and good night to Dino. Uh, the dog, that is. <laughs> okay. And then and, and, and our cat, Elliot. Uh, 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 make sure to give Elliot some Reese's Pieces. <laughs> okay. All right. Good night, <laughs> y'all. Bye. Okay. Love you guys. Love you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. I can hear Bob yeah, giggling he's, in the he's, background like uh, a maniac. <laughs> 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 anyway, so uh, real quick, Sir Lana, um, I guess... Uh, we'll be here next week. Yeah, I don't know what will happen, but we'll all, be here. We'll be here next week. Same time, same channel. So there you go. Um, thank you for joining us on Space Boy Universe. And uh, consider donating to the cause. Go to SpaceBoyUniverse.com. Uh, we want to thank our guests tonight, Pony Trap, and we'll see you next Saturday. Good night, y'all. 
Space Boy Universe is hosted by Space Boy and Sir Lana. Executive producer is Sir Lana. Social media producer is Dennis Koch. Associate producer is Lee Ann Cordes. Music production is Space Boy of SpaceBoyMusic.com. Special thanks goes out to Lee Ann K. K28, Solars Blue Raven, Patrick Spurrer, Dino, Bob and Beverly M. This has been a Space Boy Universe production. Support the universe by exploring Space Boy Universe with Space Boy and Sir Lana. Sweet Dreams Space Cadets.